Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. It's the podcast where I, Spencer, am reading this book in short little sections, and I make comments and jokes and things about it, uh, and it's a lot of fun. I It's very educational, and, uh, you, you know, it's going to be a fun journey to go through this for the next 10 plus years. All right, the first word in this episode is custom house. One word. Uh, could also be customs house. Noun from the 15th century. A building where customs and duties are paid or collected and where vessels are entered and cleared. You, you gotta enter and clear those vessels. The sound effect shall be... Uh, yeah, I do sound effects in between each word, so it's a very clear designation of where they start and end. Sometimes it's a little musical thing. Sometimes it's a sound effect. If you would like to record your own sound effect and send it to me, maybe I will put it in an episode. Uh, the whole episode will have your sound effect. You can email me, dictionarypod at gmail.com. All of that info is in the show notes. Same idea if you want to record a short little song with words or not. Five to 15 seconds is fine. Maybe I will put it at the beginning of an episode. Speaking of, by the time you're hearing this, um, I actually will probably be putting in uh, a musical intro made by my friend Tom Meslowski. I've asked a couple other people, so maybe by the time this is airing, I will have a couple other ones as well. But uh, yeah, just trying to make this a little bit more fun and interesting and more of like a show. A show. All right. So the sound effect I did was pew. Now, it's, it's something close enough. The next word is customize with an S, British variation of customize with a Z, which is our next word. Customize. Transitive verb from 1923 to build, fit, or alter according to individual specifications. Whatever your specifications are from you, you are the individual. I mean, it could also come from a group of people, but it's, you know, specific. And uh, yeah, build it, fit it, alter it. Customizable is an adjective. We all love it when things are customizable. That's why we have all these restaurants that are like, you get you get to customize it whatever you want. Is it a burrito? Is it a pizza? Is it another kind of thing? You make it the way you want it. They make it the way you want it. Customization is a noun, and customizer is a noun. The one who is doing the customizing. Next is custom made. Two words with a hyphen. Adjective from... 1845, made to individual specifications, as in custom-made clothing. I don't think I have any custom-made clothing. Mm, nope, don't think so. I've probably gotten something altered, so I guess technically that would be, but I don't even know if I, if that's even true. Yeah. Shot. Next is custom tailor. Two words with a hyphen. Tailor is T-A-I-L-O-R. The one who does the making of these custom clothes. This one, though, is a transitive verb. It's not the person. The person is not called the custom tailor. They're just called the tailor. This is what the tailor is doing. To alter, plan, or build according to individual specifications or needs. Same idea as custom made. We are already on our last word. It is the word cut. First form. There are many, many definitions in this first form. And then we're going to get forms two and three in tomorrow's episode. So, cut. Verb. From the 13th century... Starting with transitive, somewhere it will change. There's intransitive. It's about, it's about halfway. 1A, to penetrate with or as if with an edged instrument. 
an edged instrument. It has an edge. It's probably sharp. And it is penetrating into something. 1B. To hurt the feelings of. Ooh, that just cuts to the bone what you just said about me. It's probably true, though. 1C. To strike sharply with a cutting effect. 1D. To strike with a glancing blow that imparts a reverse spin. So the thing that you are striking is a ball. And, uh, you know, the, the first thing I could think of is a cue ball in billiards. If you hit it, cut it straight down or down real low, it will, uh, it will put some spin on it. So it'll spin backwards. E. One E, I should say. To experience the growth of through the gum. And this is talking about a tooth. When the tooth is pushing through the gums, it's very, uh, I've heard it's painful for the little kids. Um, I guess, though, when you're a little older and you're losing your teeth, you, you experience it again. I don't remember what it feels like, but I guess it, it can be kind of painful. But yes, it's cutting through the gum. 2A, synonyms are trim and pare, P-A-R-E, as in cut one's nails. Something that I forget to do often, so they get very long. They are currently actually very long, and I've been meaning to cut them. So maybe after this, I shall go cut my nails. A lot of people don't like the sound of that. To B, to shorten by omissions, as in cut the manuscript. To be, parts are being omitted, so it's shorter. That's how it works. To C, synonyms are dilute and adulterate, as in cut the whiskey with water. Cutting it down, uh, diluting it. Um, I think Mark Marin says that he will get ice cream and then he will cut it with vanilla. Like 50-50 maybe. I don't know what proportions he uses. But uh, yeah, personally, I don't, I don't need to dilute my ice cream or anything. I just want full full ice cream flavor. You're giving me some sort of chocolate peanut butter cookie dough pretzel banana thing. That's what I'm going to eat. 2D. To reduce in amount, as in cut costs. 3A. The synonyms are mow, M-O-W, and reap, R-E-A-P, as in cut hay. Cut hay. 3B1. To divide into parts with an edged tool. As in, cut bread. <laughs> I think it's, I love these descriptions. To divide into parts with an edge tool. Okay, you're, you're cutting it with a knife. I'm just simplifying it. Can you please uh, go divide that bread into parts for me with an edge tool? Cutting bread. 3B2, the synonyms are fell and hew. H-E-W. So yeah, it's like, Cutting something down. 3C1. I, I need to put my finger over here so I don't lose my place because this is just this big, big block of text. 3C1. To separate or discharge from an organization. As in, cut them from the team. Why did they get cut? Are they just not a good player? Or were they mean? Maybe if you're being disrespectful to your teammates or anybody, you might get cut. Don't do that. Be cool, man. 3C2. To single out and isolate. As in, cut a calf out from the herd. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I can guess what usually is the reason for that. But sometimes it's maybe because they're sick. I'm just going to say that. 3D. To turn sharply. And we're talking about a steering wheel. Cut the wheel to, to go sharply, to turn sharply. As in, the driver cut the wheel hard. When you're parallel parking, you want to cut the wheel so you're, you go in at a more sharp angle. 3E, to go or pass around or about. Synonym is bypass. As in, 
cut the checkout line. How can you do that? You can't, you can't skip the checkout line at the store. You just can't do that. You can't cut, cut in line. 4A, to divide into segments, as in cut the cake. Instead of saying a slice of cake, I'm going to say I would like a segment of cake. Please divide my cake into segments. 4B, the synonyms are intersect and cross, as in one line cutting another. It's like it's cutting it in two. For C, synonyms are break and interrupt, as in cut our supply lines. For D1, to divide into two portions. And the example is talking about a deck of cards. Cut the deck, cut the cards. Um, you, it could be two, it could be more than two. I have practiced a little bit with doing this with one hand, but I have very small hands, so it's not very easy for me to do. But I've been able to do it a couple of times. You can either do it that way, where you like drop part of it and then flip it around, or you can like spin a couple of part, like a part of it, in one direction, and then you bring it around. But yeah, my hands don't don't do that very well. I lost my place. Um. Okay, that was dividing a deck of cards into two portions. 4D2, to draw from the deck. And you might be drawing a card from the deck. I've never heard it used that way. I've only heard cutting with card deck of cards in, you know, breaking it into a couple of uh, chunks, but not pulling a card. 4E, to divide into shares. And the synonym is split. 4F. Synonyms are analyze and break down. As in, any way you cut it, we won. Any way you analyze the information that you have or break it down, we still won the game. We did it. 5A. To make by or as if by cutting. As 5A1. The synonym is carve, as in cut stone. It's got to be very difficult to cut into stone, especially many, many years ago when they didn't have the best tools. 5A2, to shape by grinding, as in cut a diamond. 5A3, have we ever seen a three? 5A3, the synonym is engrave. 5A4, to shear or hollow out, as in cut a groove. If I just heard somebody say cut a groove, I would think that they are talking about dancing. Go cut a groove on that dance floor. 5B1, to sing, play, or act for the recording of, as in Cut an album. Also, cut a commercial. I still don't know why they call it cut. Cut an album. Is it because each track, you could call it a cut? Sometimes they'll say that. I'm not sure. It's not very clear. Okay, 5B2. I think that's where we're at. To sing or play as a song or a track for a studio recording. Yeah. It's similar, a song or a track, you're cutting it. But yeah, is it, being, is it because it used to be cut physically into a vinyl record? Is that where that term came from? Music people, let me know. 5C, to type on a stencil. 5D, the synonym is the 1B definition for the word edit, as in cut a motion picture. That makes sense because back in the day, they were literally cutting the frames, the physical film, into frames. 6A. Synonyms are stop and cease, as in cut the nonsense. Cut it out. Uh, We do have some phrases later, but I don't think cut it out is one of them. 
but please cut the nonsense. Oh, I guess that means I have to stop this podcast. 6B, to refuse to recognize, and who might you not recognize an acquaintance? As in, they cut her dead at the party. Ooh, that's, they just gave her the cold shoulder. That's, I wonder why. Did she, was she not cool or are they just being mean? 6C, to absent oneself from, and you might be absent from a class. Cut, cut class. Yeah, we have, nobody has ever done that. I've never cut class before, for sure. 6D, to stop by opening a switch. And the thing that you might be stopping is a motor. 6E, to stop the filming of. And we're talking about a motion picture scene. When you're done filming a scene or a shot, you say cut. Cut, you stop. It's not, you're not physically cutting anything, but you just stop recording. Cut. I have said that many times, and I will say it many more times. 7A, to engage in. And the example is a frolicsome or mischievous action. We have an example. On summer night, wait. On summer nights, strange capers are cut under the thin guise of a Christian festival. And that is a quote from D.C.P.D. P-E-A-T-T-I-E. To engage in. Interesting quote. Next is 7B. To give the appearance or impression of, as in, cut a fine figure. Not sure what kind of figure we're talking about. Number eight. To be able to manage or handle. And this is usually used in negative constructions, as in, can't cut that kind of work anymore. Can't cut. I've heard you, you can't cut it. That's a similar idea. 9A. To yield or accord to another. And the synonym is give. As in, cut me some slack. Give me some slack, man. 9D. To fill out and sign. And uh, we're talking about a check. You fill it out, you sign it, you're cutting a check. Not sure why it's cut. You rip it off the thing. Okay, we're not done yet. I'm sorry. Now we have the intransitive definitions. It's a bit shorter. 1A, to function as or as if as an edge tool. 1B, to undergo incision or severance, as in, cheese cuts easily. Incision or severance. You're severing the cheese. You have created an incision in the block of cheese. Some of it cuts easily. Some of it doesn't. Go, don't go cutting the cheese. All right. Um, that was the cheese example. Now we are on 1C. To perform the operation of dividing, severing, incising, or intersecting. 1D. To make a stroke with a whip, sword, or other weapon. You're swinging it through the air and it cuts. Maybe just through the air, it might, if it hits something, it might cut that too. 1E. To wound feelings or... Or sensibilities, or is it wound? This is this example. I don't know if I can figure it out. To wound feelings or sensibilities. One F, to cause constriction or chafing. One G, to be of effect, influence, or insignificance. No, there's no in. It's just significance. To be of effect, influence, or significance. As in, an analysis that cuts deep. 2A1. To divide a pack of cards, especially in order to decide the deal or settle a bet. You cut it. Uh, let's see. To decide who, the deal. I guess if you flip you flip the card up that uh, where you cut it, 
and whoever has maybe a higher number, that's who's going to deal or that's who wins the bet. 2A1, to draw a card from the pack. 2B, to divide spoils, and the, the synonym is split. Split, cut, makes sense. 3A, to proceed obliquely from a straight course. As in, cut across the yard. Oblique, it means it's at an angle. Um, instead of a straight course, you have gone at an angle. 3B, to move swiftly. As in, a yacht cutting through the water. 3C, to describe an oblique or diagonal line. Uh, 3D, to change sharply in direction, and the synonym is swerve. You got to cut around, maybe there's an animal in the street or a tire or something. I was just driving down the highway recently, and there was, I think like some chairs fell off of a car, so... The, the car in that lane had to swerve, had to cut away. 3E, to make an abrupt transition from one sound or image to another in motion pictures, radio, or television. So it's not a smooth dissolve or some other transition. It's just one frame is one thing, the next frame is something else. That is a cut. 1, no, 3F. To make a sudden transition or imaginative leap, as in, the story cuts to 1917. Was that the name of that movie, 1917, that was in World War I? That was a good movie. Oddly enough, there were no um, obvious cuts in that movie. It was made to look like one seamless thing. Or at least, mostly. I gotta see that again. Four, to stop photographing motion pictures. You're done, you let go off the record button or whatever it is, and you have cut. Five, to advance by skipping or bypassing another, as in, cut to the front of the line. Nobody likes it when somebody does that. Unless you give them permission, maybe they're like, oh, I only got this one thing to buy, and you have a million things to buy. Can I just cut in front of you? Yeah, that's fine. Go for it. Go for it. We have phrases that have the word cut in them, and I don't see cut the cheese or cut it out, but we have cut a deal, and this is to negotiate an agreement. Cut both ways is to have both favorable and unfavorable results or implications. Cut corners means to perform some action in the quickest, easiest, or cheapest way. Not always the best thing to do. I love cutting corners if I can, speeds things up, but sometimes, sometimes you just shouldn't cut a corner. You gotta do it the full way. You gotta go full corner. Next is cut ice, to be of importance, and this is usually used in negative constructions, as in, his his opinion cuts no ice with me. Hoo-wee, I don't care for his opinion. Next is cut it, just cut it, and that is to cut the mustard. What? What? Uh, to cut the mustard is cut it. Are we literally talking, you got you to cut the mustard? How are you cutting it? Cutting it with what? I'm not familiar with this one. Cut loose. Number one, to free from control or restraint, as in, cut us loose from the contract. We are not constrained or restrained by it. Number two, to act without restraint, as in, enjoyed cutting loose at nightclubs. I have only rarely cut loose in public. Trying to be a bit better about that. I think this podcast is helping me just be a little bit more comfortable with just just not caring. And uh, yeah, it's fun. Just go cut loose. Nobody cares. Just have fun. Cut one's teeth. And this is 
to learn, do, or perform as a beginning or at the start of one's career, as in an actress who cut her teeth on television. At the beginning of her career, that's how she learned about acting and the business, and that's how she cut her teeth. And that's from the phrase, uh, that's from the idea of, you know, the beginning of the tooth's de- uh, journey is being cut through the gums. You're cutting your teeth. I think you understand it. Oh, here is cut the mustard. Is this going to be related to cut it? This one is to achieve the standard of performance necessary for success. I have heard this one. Haven't heard the other one. But yes, do you do you cut the mustard? That's a very weird phrase. Last phrase. Oh my God, it took us forever to get here. Cut to the chase. <laughs> That's an appropriate one to end on. I did not cut to the chase until I got to the phrase, cut to the chase. This one is to get to the point. What is the point of anything? Oh, uh, sometimes sometimes you got to say cut to the chase, get to the point to people when they're just yammering on. Some people have to say it to me even. So today we had custom house, customize, customize, custom made, custom tailor, and cut. Mm-hmm. Maybe I will pick custom made as the word of the episode because it's kind of cool when you get something custom made. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. What do you get? I want something custom made for me. I don't know what I want, but I want it custom made. All right, I have spoken enough. I'm going to go do some, some work and some relaxing. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Please rate and review this podcast. Why haven't you done that yet? Go to your whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on and to, you know hit the hit the five star thing and type up a short little thing about how much you love or hate this podcast and hit submit. Don't forget to hit submit. Um, you can email me dictionarypod at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at dictionarypod if you want to see some pictures of things that I post, so pictures of things that I read in this book that I decide to post because you can see them visually. Uh, and then I, I try and make something slightly funny in the captions. Um, you can join the Patreon for a few bucks a month to get episodes very early and some exclusives. And you can call the Google Voice number that is in the show notes if you want to say something and leave a voicemail for me to hear. And you can write a little theme song that I will put in an episode, maybe. You can make a sound effect that I will also put into an episode, maybe. Good enough for this, for today. Yeah, that's great. The first word in this episode is the second form of the word cut. C-U-T. We had the first form in yesterday's episode, which was a verb. And this one is a noun from 1530. There aren't nearly as many definitions, but there are still quite a lot. It's going to be about half of this episode, maybe more. Number one, a product of cutting. You cut something, and then what is resulted is a cut as 1A1, an opening made with an edged instrument. And uh, this feels, yes, this is feeling very similar. I was like, did I did I already read this? No. I didn't. Yesterday, though, we had uh, number 1A was to penetrate with or as if with an edged instrument. So the opening made by the edged instrument is the opening. If you uh, you got a big old water bottle and you're trying to pour it out into something, but there's only the one hole, if you poke a second hole into it, that will let the air in and it will flow so much more smoothly and quickly. So that opening would be a cut. 1A2, a wound made by something sharp, and the synonym is gash. I, I don't like gashes. I just, I just don't. You can't make me. 1B, a creek, channel, or inlet made by excavation 
or worn by natural action. The Grand Canyon was made, it was worn away by natural action over millions and millions of years. There was a river just gradually wore away this massive canyon, uh, but I don't think you could call it a cut because it's too big. 1C, a surface or outline left by cutting. 1D, a passage cut as a roadway. Mm, passage cut as a roadway. All right. 1E, a grade or step, especially in a social scale. What is this? There's an example. A cut above the ordinary. A cut above the ordinary. Mm, yep. I am not familiar with that because I am solidly in that ordinary region, I believe. 1F, a subset of a set, a subset of a set, such that when it is subtracted from the set, the remainder is not connected. Oh, God. Can you please give me an example of this? There is a group of things, and a portion of them, called the cut, are removed from the bigger collection, and then the remaining stuff is not connected. I do not understand what that means. Not connected. Number 1G, a pictorial illustration is called a cut. I mean, I know that there's the there's wood cuts, cut in the wood, and you can make art from that, like a stampy kind of thing, but a pictorial illustration is a cut. 1H, the synonym, whoa, it is the 1E2 definition for the word track. T-R-A-C-K. I wonder what that is. Is this the track that you run? Like cross-country running? Mm, track cut? Maybe. I don't know. Number two for cut. The act or an instance of cutting. So number one was a product of cutting. The thing that is cut. The thing that is left over when a cut happens. But two is the act or the instance of cutting. As to a... Here we go with more letters. Uh, 2A, a gesture or expression that hurts the feelings. Just hurts the feelings. As in, made an unkind cut. Ooh, that really cuts to the bone. 2B, a straight passage or course. Just because it cuts right through. It's a straight passage or... What is it? Is it between buildings? Is it in the woods? It's a cut. 2C. A stroke or blow with the edge of a knife or other edged tool. And I hope it is not on a living thing of any kind. 2D. A lash with or as if with a whip. A whip cuts through the air and that is a cut. Maybe it hits something. 2E, the act of reducing or removing a part, as in a cut in pay. Nobody wants their pay cut. That's terrible when it happens. We don't, we, we, don't, we don't, that's not the direction we want to go with our pay. We want to go the other direction with our pay. Um, also, just removing a thing. You could get a thing cut off of your body, like a, a tumor, a mole, a wart. 2F, an act or turn of cutting cards. And then also, the result of cutting is the cut. 2G, the elimination of part of a large field from further participation, consideration, or competition, uh, as in a golf tournament. So, yeah, tournament, that's a good example. Um, if you are in this big tournament, you're participating you ha you're competing, there's some consideration for you, but, but then you don't do so good, and you get cut from the tournament. This is often used with the words miss or make uh, to denote respectively being or not being among those eliminated, as in the example, played well and made the cut. Ah, see, there you are not getting cut, but you made the cut. How... 
this is a very weird, weird way the words are put together. You make the cut be- because you're not cut. What's the reason for the putting those words together like that? Oh, made the cut. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Number three, something that is cut or cut off as 3A, a length of cloth varying from 40 to 100 yards. And that is also equivalent to 36.6 meters or 91.4 meters. 40 to 100 yards or 36.6 to 91.4 meters. And why is it such a specific number? I mean, it's a specific range of numbers, I should say. A length of cloth in between those lengths. But what is a thing below 40 yards or above 100 yards? It's just impossible. 3B. The yield of products cut especially during one harvest. Oh, would you would you cut in uh, yams this year? Oh, I cut 40 to 100 yards. Ah, well, I cut 36.6 to 91.4 meters. Oh, that's not as good as my yards, but it's still pretty good. 3C. A segment or section of a meat carcass or a part of one. I think it's weird that they put a segment or a section, but then it says at the end, or a part of one. Aren't those the same things? A segment, a section, or a part? Shouldn't that, isn't that all the same? 3D. Whoa. A group of animals selected from a herd. They've been cut away from the herd for some reason. 3E. The synonym is share, S-H-A-R-E, as in, took his cut of the profits. It's his share. You're, there's five people. They all get one-fifth of the profits. It's their cut, their share. Number four, a voluntary absence from a class. Uh, involuntary absence would be when you get sick and you, you did not control the sickness uh, come on, get down with the sickness. No, and uh, no, but when you voluntarily leave class, you are cutting class. Uh, I, w- I was not a kid who did this. This was not, you know, I, I was. I went to school every day. I rarely got sick, but you know, if I did, I did. But I went to class. But there, there were definitely a couple occasions where I did this on purpose. I am not promoting that, but I had, I had very good reasons. Five A. A stroke that cuts a ball. Also, the spin imparted by such a stroke. And I think I remember from yesterday, it's been a day since I recorded yesterday's episode, but yeah, it was something about you hit the ball, like, like the cue ball in, in billiards, you hit it in a certain way and it'll give some backspin. That's what we're talking about, I think. Or some other spin. 5B, a swing by a batter at a pitched baseball. It's like the bat is cutting through the air. 5C, an exchange of captures in checkers. Hmm, an exchange of captures in... Oh, so if like one... If the black captures a red, and then red captures the black, and then vice versa, back and forth and back and forth, they call that a cut? Hmm, interesting. Didn't uh, I didn't get into the professional checkers world to know this terminology. Six. A result of editing, as 6A, an abrupt transition from one sound or image to another in motion pictures, radio, or television. Uh, I I could make a cut here. I don't usually make any cuts in my uh, my podcasts here. Uh, I I, I used to edit a lot, um, but, uh, but I don't anymore. So I could, to make it very obvious, I will cut out um a part of a word or or part 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 way through a word where it will be i don't know but i will make sure to cut it so it makes it very obvious and was that obvious i hope it was Uh, okay 6b an edited version of a film any version the first version the last version they that's a cut Oh, I got. Can I watch that cut? Can I watch the director's cut? Can I watch the producer's cut? 
Can I watch the rough cut? Can I watch the, the, you know, the, those are all cuts. 7A. The shape and style in which a thing is cut, formed, or made. As in, close of the latest cut. And I think that makes sense because uh, clothes are literally, usually, cut from fabric. So it's that makes sense. 7B. The synonyms are pattern and type. Pattern and type. 7... That was 7B. Not sure what came out of my mouth for that. But next we have 7C. The synonym is haircut. The shape and style in which a thing is cut. Uh, that was 7A. Similar... Similar world haircut. I got a haircut recently, and I've gotten a fair amount of compliments on that, which doesn't usually happen, so it was a good haircut, I guess. There is one phrase, cut of one's jib, and the synonyms for this are appearance and style. The, you, you would use this when you, you, you like somebody's appearance or style. You say, I like, their, I like the cut of their jib. You, that jib over there, I like it. I like the cut of it. Cut cut that jib. You, they, you got that jib cut real good. Okay, well, that was just the first word. Now I have to do a sound effect, which will just be... E Third form of cut. Adjective from... Oh, there's no year. It is just marked by a well-developed and highly defined musculature. <laughs> as in the example cut abs and that couldn't be further from the truth for me my abs are are cut from a slab of more abs <laughs> not cut at all is what i'm trying to say e next is cutability noun from 1965 the proportion of lean Salable meat, no, saleable, I think it's saleable. The proportion of lean, saleable meat yielded by a carcass. <laughs> Nobody's got to convince me to cut out my meat, but I hope when you see the word carcass in relation to meat, maybe that will, I don't know, make you think differently. It's supposed to be a, a door creak, maybe. Next is cut and dried. Three words with a hyphen. Also, it could just be cut and dry. Dry or dried. Adjective from 1710. Bean or done according to a plan, set procedure, or formula. As in, uh, no, synonym is routine. As in, a cut and dried or dry presentation. So it's just, yeah, I think cut and dry is what we use normally. It's just very uh, formulaic, set to, it's a plan. Step A, step step one, two, three, get it done. Nothing fancy, nothing creative. Cut and dry presentation. It's probably boring. E Next is cut and paste. Three words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1953. Pieced together by excerpting and combining fragments from multiple sources. As in, the book was a cut and paste job. So it was very easy to make that book because they just cut different sections from other things and put them all together. Uh, and I use cut and paste a lot on the computer. It is, they are my friends. I love cut and paste so, so much. Yee! Next is cut and try. T-R-Y. Three words with hyphens. Adjective from 1903. Marked by trial and error. As in, cut and try methods. Also as in, Cut and try testing. So yeah, trial and error, cut and try. It's when um, you just you just have to try something and see if it works or not. And uh, it probably won't. And that's why you have to keep on doing it over and over again. Trial and error, though. I don't know if I agree with the word error there. I feel like error 
means more like a mistake. And I feel like often it's it's not so much that a mistake is happening, it's that the result, it's just not going to give you the result that maybe you were hoping for. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way, but that's kind of how I view it. Should be should be trial and something else. Trial and fail? Even that one doesn't really work great. E- Next is cutaneous. C-U-T-A-N-E-O-U-S. Adjective from 1578. Of relating to or affecting the skin. As in, a couple examples, a cutaneous nerve. So it's a, it's a, it's a nerve by the skin, in the skin, under the skin. It's a skin nerve. Also as in, cutaneous anthrax. So I guess this is anthrax that's going to affect your skin. I know that you can breathe in anthrax, but you, either way, you don't want anthrax anywhere near you. Cutaneously is an adverb, and the etymology, it is from the Latin cutis, C-U-T-I-S, which means skin, and there's more at the word hide. That is probably, I was first thinking like hide and seek. Oh, you're hiding away your, your intestines with your skin, but no, it's the hide when you cut the skin off of a thing. It's called a hide. Cutaneous. That would be a good one to figure out backwards. I haven't talked about that in a little while. I have uh, on my YouTube channel, information is in the show notes. I have some videos where I teach you how to say things backwards phonetically, and then you can reverse it, and it sounds sort of normal. Not really, but it's close enough. Next is the first form of cutaway. Cut away, but it is one word, Adjective from 1841, having or showing parts cut away, as in a cut away drawing. So uh, what what does that mean, a cut away drawing? You, I mean, a cut away, I can think of it as like in in a piece of wood, maybe you're cutting away parts, a sculpture, you're cutting away parts, a drawing though, a cut away drawing. Maybe I need to find a picture and post it on social media. Uh, is it like an, a negative space kind of thing where you're where you draw the parts of not the thing and then the thing appears in the negative space? I'm not sure. E. Now we have the second form of cutaway, noun from 1849. One, a coat with skirts tapering from the front waistline. To form tails at the back. Number two, A. A cutaway picture or representation. To B. A shot that interrupts the main action of a film or television program to take up a related subject or to depict action supposed to be going on at the same time as the main action. It's a lot, lot of information there. But it is accurate. Uh, yeah, if I'm thinking about movies or TV shows, um, the easiest example is somebody is talking or something is happening, and then you cut away to say somebody's reaction of the main thing that's happening, the main thing of the person talking, the main thing, the event, whatever it is. But you cut away to show maybe how somebody is reacting or how it is affecting something else or something else. That, but yeah, it's all about. Something's happening at that same time, but you're cutting away from the main point. It's a cutaway shot. Three, a back dive in which the head is lowered toward the board after the takeoff. Is this literally a dive into a pool? A back dive in which the head is lowered toward the board a ba- I think a back dive is you're diving backwards. Your back is towards the, hmm, I don't know, a back dive. But yeah, that that's sure. Why it's called a cutaway, I don't know. E- 
Next is cut back. One word, noun from 1897. One, something cut back. Oh, that's very nice. Good definition. Two, synonym is reduction, as in a cutback in funding. Nobody wants that. I'm, I'm getting very disappointed. Getting. I'm already very disappointed that there is there are cutbacks in funding for the arts in schools and all around and, uh, you know, things like that and science. You know, anything in the STEAM world, science, technology, uh, engineering, arts, math, all that, we, we can't have any more cutbacks because these are very, very, very important things in life. E. Next is cut back two words. This is a verb from 1871, starting with transitive, which is just to shorten by cutting. And the synonym is prune. Maybe, maybe the bushes in front of your house are getting real big and overgrown and you don't like it. So then you, you cut them back. Uh, here we have intransitive, number one, to, to interrupt the sequence of a plot by introducing events prior to those last presented. Uh, and the plot, we're talking about maybe a movie. So a cutback. Honestly, this is a, a term I have not really heard. Um, so something, a scene happens in a movie. We just got some uh, in, um, information, but then... But then we cut back to what happened before that scene. Oftentimes we'll call that a flashback, but I guess you could also say a cutback. But yeah, that's a weird one. Two, the synonym is cut down, which will be the last word in this episode. I know it's two words. I get it. I just, for simplicity's sake, I just call it a word. Don't worry about it. So yeah, the synonym is cut down, as in the example, cut back on sugar. Something that Spencer should probably do. He's working on it. He's trying to be good about his sugar intake, but you know what? Sometimes he just doesn't care. Next is Kutch. C-U-T-C-H. Kutch. Noun from 1759 and it is the the a definition oh see now i, I want to go back to this word it is way way back hold on hold on i'm gonna i want to get there because i want to make sure i pronounce it correctly this goes way back into the ca's the c-a-t where's c-a-t we're 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 so, oh so close don't you worry we're getting okay how do you spell this it it's a uh, katechu is that how you say it? Katechu? Katechu. Bless you. Thank you. All right. We are oh so close. Here we go. We're, we're looking. We're scrolling. Here it is. Uh, Katechu. What is this? Uh, it is a substance obtained from tropical plants. It is the extract of the heartwood in the East Indian acacia. Uh, okay. So it's this, uh, this thing that grows. Katechu. So, um, oh, it was the A definition. Yeah, that one is the, uh, the extract of the heartwood of an East Indian acacia. Acacia catechu. So it's also called kutch. It's modified of the Malay word kachu. <laughs> Sounds exactly like a sneeze. K-A-C-H-U. E. Last word for this episode is cut down two words. Verb from 1571, starting with transitive. 1A, to strike down and kill or incapacitate. Uh, maybe maybe a big wild animal is attacking you. Maybe you shouldn't be in their world in the first place. But anyway, they're coming to get you and you uh, attack them back or just a person. It doesn't have to be an animal. Let's use people as an example. Somebody's uh, going to attack you, but you are able to get in a hit or a, a, a something, and then you they fall down, 
incapacitated or dead, and you have cut them down. Don't know why I had to go through that whole description. 1B. The synonym is knockdown. 2A. To remodel by removing extras or unwanted furnishings or fittings. I hate it all. Cut it down. 2B. To remake in a smaller size. Hey, that thing that you made, I love it, but make it smaller. That reminds me of that scene in uh, Zoolander when he thinks that the the model building is the real building. It's like, you can't fit people in here. I don't remember the words, but it was funny. Those were transitive. Now we've got intransitive. There's just one of those. To reduce or curtail volume or activity, as in cut down on smoking. I believe that would be a very good thing for people to do. Reduce the volume of the smoking in your face. There is one phrase, cut down to size, and that means to reduce from an inflated or exaggerated importance to true or suitable stature. Uh, hmm, okay, so yeah, maybe, I'm try- I like to think of examples because it helps me understand and maybe it helps you understand as well um, if you have never heard this phrase, which, you know, most many people have. But yeah, maybe there's uh, somebody, it's like, oh, go pick on somebody your own size. You, you talk to them and you make them, somebody's all, somebody's all high and mighty on themselves and I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. But then you talk to them and you get them to calm down and chill out and you, maybe you cut them down to size, their proper size. So the words today were cut, cut, cutability, cut and dried, cut and paste, cut and try cutaneous, cut away, cut away, cut back, cut back, kutch, and cut down. Well, I know it wasn't exactly the same thing, but I'm going to pick cut and paste as the word of the episode because I very much enjoy using the shortcuts on the keyboard for cut and paste in my daily life, daily work. Uh, They're very handy, and I just wish I could use them and also undo in my real life when I'm not on a computer. Cut and paste. I love you. You're so great. You help me make things happen easier when I'm working on a computer. That's going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening to all of this nonsense. Go do all of the things that I talked about at the beginning of the episode where you can you can go find them in the show notes and just Be good to people. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Um, okay. So, uh, hey, let's talk about the words. Let's just get right into it. Uh, this is going to be the first section on page 309. And, uh, we got a few lines on the previous page at the bottom. And those three lines are for the word cute. Cute. C-U-T-E, first form, adjective from circa 1731. What would have been considered cute in 1731? This is before America was even America. Uh, Okay, 1A, clever or shrewd, often in an unhanded manner. Clever or shrewd. This is not a form... I'm probably familiar with. 1B, the synonym is impertinent. Oh, there's another synonym on the next line. It is, (laughs) yeah, this makes sense. Smart alecky. Smart hyphen alecky. As in, don't get cute with me. Don't be all smart alecky, impertinent, clever or shrewd in an underhanded manner. I feel like that is definitely something that many parents have said to their teenagers. Number two, attractive or pretty, especially in a childish, youthful, or delicate way. Oh, so cute. That that was a line from, uh, what was that movie? It was a very, it was a comedy. The guy took footage from a martial arts movie 
and CGI'd himself into it and then shot other footage and created a whole new plot. And I think it was Kung Pao. I think that's what it was called. There may have been a sequel too. But yeah, there's a funny scene where a woman picks up a baby and says, So cute! And it has just stuck with me because it was just... And then, then what happened after that is very silly. Three for cute. Obviously straining for effect. Obviously straining for effect. What even does that mean? Straining for effect. I don't understand. I All I'm imagining is somebody trying very hard to do something they're straining and then all of a sudden their face goes very cute with i don't know rosy cheeks and big eyes cutely is an adverb and cuteness is a noun so cute how much cuteness yeah this is just short for acute a c u t e uh but i have no idea how it became all these things smart alecky and attractive or pretty in a childish youthful or delicate way Hmm. Maybe we have to go back to acute, but I'm not going to go do that right now. So, oh, maybe I can come up with a cute sound effect. I probably can't. But, you know, I think of just the stereotypical, you know, there was that very cute character in the second Lego movie. Very, you know, childish and quote-unquote girly. You know, I, that's, that's very genderized. I'm sorry for that. But, you know, what, what sound can we make that's like that? We could, we could just do something like a... Oh, yeah, that's good. Oh, that's cute. Second form for cute. Noun from 1965. The quality or state of being cute or cutesy. Also, an instance of cuteness or cutesiness. This is usually used in plural, as in a movie suffering from a case of the cutes. <laughs> I just, I've never heard anybody say that before. The, a case of the cutes. Do you have a case of the cutes? What what happens when you have a case of the cutes? Uh, yeah. I saw, last night I went and saw Doctor Strange, and that does not suffer from a case of the cutes, I don't think. I mean, there are, it has its moments, just like many movies. Oh. Next is cutesy. Adjective from... 1914, self-consciously or excessively cute. Cutesiness is a noun. Nobody has ever accused me of being cutesy, unless maybe I'm really trying. Like when I say, "oh." Next is cut glass. Cut glass, two words. Noun from 1761, glass that is cut with a very sharp edge is not cute in my book. I wouldn't call that cute, but maybe if you put some googly eyes on it, maybe it becomes cute. This is glass ornamented with patterns cut into its surface by an abrasive wheel and polished. Cut glass. I actually uh, did some. It wasn't uh, with an abrasive wheel, but um, uh, in uh, in high school, I took a metal sculpture class for like my applied arts the credit and uh, it was very cool and uh, but one of the things it was not metal but we did we were assigned to um uh not cut glass specifically but make a little pattern on a piece of glass and then there was a machine that would with high pressure i don't know if it was blowing sand or something on it but um but yeah you could you could you know make a make something that's this like a uh, uh, different different um oh, what am i trying to say i think you understand you could you could etch in a pattern or letters or something into it. That that was cool. Not literally cut, but similar idea. Oh, it was so cute what I made. It, I don't even remember what I made, and I'm sure it's gone. So next we have cut grass. Yeah, grass with an R. Two words with a hyphen, cut grass. Noun from circa 1818. A grass with minute hooked bristles along the edges of the leaf blade. Hmm, I don't think I'm familiar with this. This is this is uh, grass that's going to try try to cut you. Uh, the genus name is Lyrsia. So maybe we need to find a picture of cut grass, like a cool close-up macro shot, because I want to see what these 
uh, hooked bristles look like? I wonder if you can see them with the naked eye. Hmm. What is the purpose of these minute hooked bristles? Aww. Next is cuticle. C-U-T-I-C-L-E. Noun from 1615. One, an outer covering layer. Just anything that, maybe the, the tarp on your pool, you could call it a cuticle. A pudicle. No, though that, that, that went in the wrong direction. An outer covering layer, as 1A, an external envelope, as of an insect, secreted usually by epidermal cell, cells. External, an external envelope, secre- so uh, this insect might be secreting something that envelops what? What does envelop? Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a cuticle because it is an outer covering layer. 1B, the outermost layer of animal integument composed of epidermis. And of course, your epidermis is an outer covering layer. It covers your body. So you could probably just call your skin your cuticle. Maybe not scientifically, but technically, yes. 1C, a thin, continuous, fatty, or waxy film on the external surface of many higher plants that consists chiefly of cutin, which we will learn about soon. 1D, the outermost membranous layer of a hair consisting of overlapping scales of epithelial cells. The outermost membranous layer of a hair. So I guess just the outside of your hair is uh, is a cuticle. Well, I thought that was maybe on the inside. I don't know. Epithelial cells. Number two, dead or horny epidermis. And uh, they didn't specifically say this, although I have to assume that this would be maybe the number two, the number two definition. The the edge between your skin and your nail on your finger or your toe, uh, that I've heard is the cuticle. So there's that little edge, so that must be just at the edge of the skin. Uh, It's just dead. Maybe it's a little bit tougher, and uh, that's the cuticle. You gotta gotta take care of your cuticles. You know, mine, some some parts are good. Some parts are are, uh, a little rough, a little cracked. I try and lotion up, but uh, yeah. Take care of your cuticles. Um, cuticular. That is an adjective. Cuticular. This is from the Latin cuticula, which is a diminutive of cutis, which means skin. And I feel like recently we had something, maybe in cut, I don't remember where it was. We were learning about that. Um, or possibly, it's, uh, it's in an episode coming up because I already recorded it, but maybe not. Anyway, cuticular cute cutis means skin there's more at the word hide yeah we had that recently oh next is cutie c-u-t-i-e or c-u-t-e-y noun from 1908 an attractive person especially a pretty girl please don't go calling random people you see on the street cutie or any other similar word, there's a pretty good chance they're not going to appreciate that. Maybe just uh, talk to them like a normal person first. You know, be, be, be normal. Uh, Yeah, that's people, people say that. Some people love it. Some people don't like it. Oh, next is cutie pie. This is very similar. It's cutie hyphen pie, P-I-E. Noun from 1956, a cute person, and then also the synonym sweetheart. If you got a sweetheart, if you're dating, if you're going steady, maybe you're going to call them your cutie pie. Because they are cute, they are a cutie, and you also uh, want to eat pie with them. Oh, that's a sweet image. Next is cutin. And yeah, we just saw this in the 1C definition for cuticle, which 
was kind of long a thin continuous fatty or waxy film on the external surface of many higher plants that consists chiefly of cutin so what is cutin noun from circa 1872 an insoluble mixture containing waxes fatty acids soaps and resinous material that forms a continuous layer on the outer epidermal wall of a plant. Mm-hmm. Cutin. Aw. Next is cutin again, but it's not pronounced that way. I apologize. It is just cut in. Cut in, two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1883. Something cut in. That's it. And then cut in is also an adjective. Something cut in. Well, there could be lots of things cut in to lots of other things. So maybe we should read the next one because that is aw, cut in, two words with a hyphen. No, this one does not have a hyphen. That's what I meant to say. This one, cut in, this is a verb from 1612. And uh, so anything, any noun that comes from the process of this verb, of the definitions we're about to read, would be considered cut in with a hyphen, which is just something cut in. So we're starting with intransitive verb number one, to thrust oneself into a position between others or belonging to another. We see this all the time in movies and TV shows. I don't know how much it happens in real life, but maybe some. The two people are dancing, and then somebody else comes in and says, Can I cut in, please? May I just stop your nice moment of dancing so I can create my own moment of dancing with one of you or both of you? Yeah. Number two. To join in something suddenly. As in, cut in on the conversation. Sometimes that's appreciated. Sometimes you're like, dude, we're having a conversation ourselves. You don't need to cut in. Sometimes if I'm overhearing a conversation, I really want to say something. And usually I do not. But every once in a while, if you feel like it's appropriate, you got to read the room. It, It might be okay to do that. If you know the people, maybe it's okay. Number three, to interrupt a dancing couple. Here's this more specific example. To interrupt a dancing couple and take one as one's partner. Sorry, I'm just going to take you away right now. You can't wait till the end of the dance? The end of this song? Wait, wait your turn. Four. To become automatically connected or started in operation. As in, waiting for the auxiliary motor to cut in. Now we have transitive one, to mix with cutting motions, and this is, uh, we have have an example, after sifting the flour into a mixing bowl, cut the lard in. Mm Mm-hmm. That lard has to be cut in because it is lard and maybe a little tough. It's not going to mix easily with uh, flour or liquids. So that is a thing that could be cut in. It is something cut in to the rest of the ingredients. Two, I almost did my awe sound effect there. That's not where you do it. Number two, to introduce into a number, group, or sequence. It's very vague because it could be lots of things with numbers, groups, or sequences. Maybe this is in the math world since numbers are related. Numbers are included. Numbers are part of that three to connect into an electrical circuit to a mechanical apparatus so as to permit operation and maybe that sounds like it's related to the example of the motor cutting in yeah to become automatically connected or started in operation that was the intransitive definition that seems uh connected number four to include especially among those benefiting or favored. As in, cut them in on the profits. Gotta gotta include the other people. If they helped you out in some way, maybe they deserve some of the profits as well. Don't be getting all greedy. 
Aww, so cute. Next is cutinized. Adjective from 1901. And this is just infiltrated with cutin. That is the insoluble mixture containing waxes, fatty acids, soaps, and resinous material that forms a continuous layer on the outer epidermal wall of a plant. So if you are taking that stuff, if you're going to infiltrate that stuff into something else, you have cutinized that thing. Aww. Next is cutis. C-U-T-I-S. Noun from 1603. The synonym is dermis. Dermis. One of the parts of your skin. The cutis. Hmm. Interesting. I don't remember if that's the top part or the next layer in. I think it's the out I think it's the outer layer of your skin. Aw. Next is cutlass. C U T L A S S. I know that there's a car called a cutlass, but that's all I know. Noun from 1584. One, a short curving sword formerly used by sailors on warships. And if it's from the 1500s, it might look kind of cool. So maybe we should post a picture of a cutlass on Instagram and Twitter at DictionaryPod. If you want to go look at it, you can like it, make that little heart red, and then maybe you can comment on it too. Number two, this synonym is, you could pronounce this a couple ways, machete or machete. Uh, yeah, but that's a short curving sword, so it's uh, probably very similar to the one that the, the sailors used on warships. It's always handy to have a sharp device on you. This is from... Middle French coutelas, which is an augmented form of coutel, which means knife. Um, and then it is from the Latin culter, which means knife or plowshare. So cutlass literally just means knife. And I'm sure it's not a coincidence that the word cut is in there. I don't remember. Um, let's see. Well, actually, let's go back. Yeah, um, I don't have specifics to tell you, but I'm sure that, you know, our word cut, cutting a thing with a sharp thing, is related to these, you know, Latin and Middle French words. Knife, cut, yeah. Who knew? Who knew that the word cut is basically, it's very uh, etymologically related to the word knife. So that I like it when things make sense like that. Next is Cutler. Oh, well, wait, the Cutlass, back to Cutlass. Is that car like the Cutlass Supreme or something? What, does, are you saying that your car is a sword, is a knife? Uh, is there, is there, are there curved, sharp things going on in the car that makes you call it a Cutlass? Hmm, maybe there's another, another thing, another definition for this word that they didn't put here in the book. Okay, back to, ah. Oh, Cutler, noun from the 14th century, one who makes, deals in, or repairs cutlery. Cutlery, it's spoons, it's forks, it's knives, it's probably other things. So the cutler is making, fixing, or selling those devices. Oh, and here is those devices. Oh, cutlery. Is there cute cutlery? What? Maybe we need to find some cute cutlery. We could put it on social media. We could also put it in the show notes. Uh, what would that be? Is it? Is it? Yeah. I mean, I think really anything made for kids is probably going to be cute. There's going to be cartoon characters on it. It might have a sort of cute shape if you could make a fork cute. Um, yeah. I mean, I definitely had some of that stuff when I was a kid, and it's they've they've changed. It's gotten real intense. Um, but uh, wait, wait, can you make... Yeah, I'm sure that there's cute cutlery out there. Okay, I don't know if I made the sound. Ah, cutlery. Noun from the 15th century. One, the business of a cutler. Two, edged or cutting tools, 
specifically implements for cutting and eating food. A spoon, it's kind of weird to call a spoon cutlery, but it is there for eating food. You can't really cut things with a spoon unless it's one of those ones that has, I think they, they have made spoons with little edges on them for like maybe camping or something. Uh, big edge, yeah, that's it. Cutlery, cutlery. Um, it's very, very handy. We actually have, uh, not that we ever go camping, but we were given a couple, uh, some camping-like things, and there's, I think it's got like a spoon on one end, and there's like a fork on the other end. There might even be a little bit of a blade in there somewhere, too. I can't remember, but, um, yeah. People have gotten very creative with cutlery. I love that scene in uh, the short few seconds in Wally, where he's collecting things and he finds a spork and he doesn't know which pile to put it in, the fork pile or the spoon pile. Aww. I guess sporks look kind of cute. At least those crappy plastic ones you'd get at school. Next is Cutlet. Noun from 1682, one a small slice of meat, as in a veal cutlet. Mm, Not a fan of that. Number two, a flat croquette of chopped meat or fish. This is from Old French, costelette, which is the diminutive of cost, which means rib or side, uh, from the Latin costa, and there's more at the word coast. Why coast? I'm not sure. But the whole cutting thing, it's funny though. It doesn't say that it's from anything that's cut related. It means rib or side, but then it became cut because it's it was cut off of a thing. Oh, so cute. Last word. See, I always have to do something different with the sound effect of the last word. It is cut line. Cut line. One word. Noun from 1943. These synonyms are caption and legend. Cut line. That's a new one for me. Okay, so today we had cute, cute, cutesy, cut glass, cut grass, cuticle, cutie, cutie pie, cutin, cut in, cut in, cutinized, cutis, cutlass, cutler, cutlery, cutlet, and cut line. Hmm. I mean, let's see. Maybe we'll just pick cute as the word of the episode because, I don't know, it's a fun word, maybe, but some people, some people love cute things, some people hate cute things. Can we bring those two worlds together? Can we make something cute but also not cute? Yes, I have seen some very creepy, creepy things that also are kind of cute. Everybody's different. There's something for everybody. You you might like you might find something cute that somebody else does not, and vice versa. What is cute? It's all in the eye of the beholder. Cute, cute, cute. That is it for that. I thought I had something else I was gonna say, and now I don't remember. Something about was it about cutlery? I don't know. I think it's gone forever. Um. I am very appreciative that you might be listening to this show. Uh, If you are, obviously you got to go rate and review it if you haven't done that. Um, We're getting real close to the end of the seas. It's coming up very fast. Day by day, it's coming. Um, What I I mentioned once before and what I am thinking, still thinking I will do is I will take off the month of July. Uh, No episodes in the month of July. Give myself... Uh, you know, a three or four week break. Um, and, uh, and then a- as long as everything goes to plan, um, August 1st, I will release the first episode of the letter D and very likely at that point, this will be a, uh, explicit podcast. I don't want to say adult. I don't want to say not family friendly because I personally think that everybody should be, uh, have access to all of the words uh, whatever words those may be. And, uh, so that's why I feel like it's just really important to talk about things that might be quote unquote considered adult, but I think it's really good for kids to learn about this stuff too, because it's the world 
They're going to learn it eventually. Yeah, there's just so much that we just don't get educated about when we're young. And I feel like that is a problem. I think that's a travesty. So seriously, if you're listening to this, uh, I would appreciate you sharing it. And so more people can hear it. Uh, there is, I'm hoping there's going to be a live episode soon in Chicago. Uh, and so once I have that, uh, sorted out and settled, I will be posting about it. So, you know, come, you may have to pay a few bucks for a ticket, but it will be cheap. I'll make sure it's cheap. Um, because the, the venue has got to get paid. So that would be cool if it happened. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess for some reason I feel like I, um, want you to hear my inner thoughts about things and i hope it's fun for you it's really just for me but i hope it's fun for you too that's going to be the end of this episode thank you very much for listening and until next time this is spencer dispensing information goodbye hello word nerds welcome to this episode of the dictionary podcast i am spencer i am reading this large dictionary book and then i tell you some things that i think about as i'm reading it it could be many, many, many types of things. So that's kind of what this podcast is all about. I don't do any prep. I just read the words. I don't read the definitions until I'm literally reading them into the microphone. You get to hear it off the top of my head. Uh, I also don't do any editing anymore. It's just whatever comes out, comes out. Unless, you know, I got to like blow my nose or sniffle or something. I cut that stuff out because you don't need to hear that. Maybe you do. But I have chosen currently for you to not hear that. Okay, the first word in this episode is cut off. One word, C-U-T-O-F-F. Noun from 1741. One, the act or action of cutting off. To A, the new and relatively short channel formed when a stream cuts through the neck of an oxbow. Uh, a stream, yes, I think I've heard the oxbow is some sort of natural thing. I may have to look more into this. Um, the new and relatively short channel formed when a stream cuts through the neck of an oxbow. It's some sort of natural thing. And then, yeah, a stream cuts through it, and the new part is called the cutoff. Because did it cut off something? Did it cut off the flow of the stream to somewhere else? Hmm. Waterways like that are interesting because in some some of them, in some places, they change over the years. You'd think that, oh, the river's just going to be where the river is. Not necessarily. Sometimes they move. To B, the synonym is the first definition for the word shortcut. Cut, yeah, sh cut off, shortcut. You have cut off a portion of you, what you were going to travel because you went on a shortcut. To C, a channel made to straighten a stream. Why would you want to straighten the stream? Just let the stream go where it wants to go. That's what I think. Three, a device for cutting off. Is that cutting off electricity, cutting off water, cutting off something... For A, something cut off is a cut off. For B is plural, so you would say cut offs. Shorts originally made from jeans with the legs cut off at the knees or higher. So you had some pants. You thought that you should have some shorts instead. And so you just cut off the bottom half or so, and they are now cut offs. Um... They, yeah, like it says, they could be cut off at the knees, so you got some longer shorts, or you can cut them off up real high, so they're real short cutoffs, or anywhere in between. It doesn't have to be jeans, though. I think uh, maybe people should start making cutoffs from, from other types of pants. What kind of pants are those? Don't go, don't go cutting off your fancy pants, you fancy pants, wearing fancy pants. Then you'd have fancy cutoffs. Number five, the point, date, or period for a cutoff. Point, date, or period for... I don't know what that is. Cutoff is also an adjective. 
Oh, okay, gotta do a sound effect. Maybe I'll do a short little musical thing. I don't think I've done one of those in a bit. Um, it should be something short and sweet and something like... Da -da 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 -da. Next is cut off two words. Tran um, wait, is it? Yes, it's just a verb from the 14th century, starting with transitive. One, to bring to an untimely end. It's been cut off. Two, to stop the passage of, as in cut off communications. Oh, you don't want your communications cut off. Maybe it's an apocalyptic movie and people are communicating with the radios or something and then they get cut off. Ooh, what made them cut off? Was it a monster? Was it an alien? Was it another human who doesn't want you to communicate? Hmm. It's a problem. Three. You, you can see where my brain goes usually. It often goes straight to movies. Number three. The synonyms are shut off and bar, as in the river cut off their retreat. It wouldn't let them go for some reason. Number four, the synonyms are discontinue and terminate, as in cut off a subscription. I don't want to get that newspaper anymore. Please terminate, discontinue, cut off my Subscription. I almost said prescription. Number five, synonyms are separate and isolate, as in cut herself off from her family. She probably had very good reasons, but I hope I hope that maybe they can come back together again. Number six, the synonyms are disinherit. Uh, it's just the one. As in the example, threatened to cut him off without a penny. If you don't do what I say, you are not going to get a single penny. But, you know, maybe there's good reason. Yeah. 7a, to stop the operation of, and the synonym is turn off, as in cut off the engine. No sense in letting it run if you're just sitting there waiting. Just go ahead and turn it off. You're going to waste gas. But if it's a really hot day and you need the air conditioner running and it's not going to be too long, maybe it's okay. Just be aware of your gas usage. We don't need to use more of it. 7B. To stop or interrupt while in communication. As in, the operator cut me off. I didn't have another quarter to put in the payphone. And if there's a young people listening, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, there is one intransitive definition, which is just to cease operating. The operation has ceased. It has been cut off. Okay. Do -do 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 -do. Next is cut off man. Two words. The man who cut things off. Three, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> I genuinely don't know what my brain just did there. I think I'm failing. I'm, I'm falling apart. Okay, I meant to say noun. Why I said three, I have no idea. <laughs> I got so excited to say three. All right, it is from 1967. A player in baseball who relays a ball from an outfielder to the infielder. The infield, just the infield. Uh, well, from outfield, so they this is one of the outfield players. They just throw it to the infield. Why are they called the cutoff man, though? They have cut it off from going to the home run area? <laughs> uh, maybe. Or they're, or they're trying to cut off the runner from running to more bases. Maybe that's what it is. Next is cut out one word. Noun from 1851. Um, so we have cut out. We did have cut in. I just like to find these opposites. Uh, and we had cut off. And we will not have cut on. There's no cut on. That's because we're on cut out. And that comes after alphabetically. So cut out. One. Something cut out or off 
from something else. Also, the space or hole left after cutting. Stencils are cut out. Cut out. Uh, what are what are other things that you can cut out of something else? Um, when you're making cookies, you put it put the little the put you put the shape on the cookie dough on the cutting board, and you cut out a shape. So the shape is a cutout, but then the whole left is also a cutout. Why aren't we making making negative space cookies? I think I think somebody has done that, but that's that would be cool. Why? I don't know. I just think it would be a good, fun thing to do. Look, I'm eating a negative space cookie. Obviously, you need a border, so there's something to eat and hold and cook. Okay. Uh, where were we? Number two for cut out. One that cuts out. Three, an intermediary in a clandestine operation. So there's a secret thing happening, and the person in the middle, maybe passing information from one party to another party, they are the cut out. Why? Is it because they can be cut out of the operation? Because they're not necessary? Or something else? Four, a record album no longer in production that is sold at a discount. Cut out. Hmm. It's been cut out of the the stuff and so you can't find it anymore cut out is also an adjective boo 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 i didn't try to make good notes out of those they didn't they didn't work so well next is cut out two words first form verb from the 15th century starting with transitive one to form by erosion I mentioned the Grand Canyon recently. Yes, the Grand Canyon was formed by erosion. It was cut out. The tiny, tiny little rock particles were washed away one by one by the water, cutting out a massive, very cool thing that I have never seen in person. Two, to determine or assign through necessity. To determine or assign through necessity, as in, You've got your work cut out for you. You are going to have a lot of work to do. You better go do it. Number three, to take the place of, and the synonym is supplant. I think that's how you say that word, supplant. Four, to put an end to, and then also desist from, as in cut out wasteful spending. If you're trying to save money, cut out your wasteful spending. Put an end to the wasteful spending. Five synonyms are deprive and defraud, as in cut him out of his share. Uh, I guess it depends on the context, defraud or deprive, because, uh, you know, maybe there's good reason, so you're depriving, but if you're defrauding, if you're if you're uh, cutting him out of his share, in a not fair way, that would be defraud. Number 6A, to remove from a series or circuit. The synonym is disconnect, as in cut out a car from a train. To remove from a series, yep, you cut it, cut it out. I'm sure that's not a very easy thing to do to cut out a train from the middle. It's a lot of logistics involved with that one. 6B, To make inoperative. Cutting off the power, cutting off the something to make something inoperative. Now we have intransitive. One, to depart in haste. I gotta gotta cut out of this party. I'm going to leave quickly. Two, to cease operating. Three, to swerve out of a traffic line. Who you got to be real careful about that. I'm just imagining the highway is filled with cars and maybe the shoulders are open. So then you cut out yourself from the traffic line and you, you either, you know, in this case, maybe you drive on the shoulder, but you could get in trouble. You could drive past a cop and not realize it. And then you're going to get a ticket and then you've just tried to go fast, but you made it worse. Or if you're in a really long line, 
uh, by where I live, there is a, uh, a Starbucks with a drive through and the line gets very, very long. And there's a very small parking lot. And they often, the, car, the cars are waiting in the road just to get inside the thing. So if you got a long line, just, just leave. Just cut out of that line. Do, 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 do. Next is the second form of cut out adjective from 1645 naturally fitted or suited as in not cut out to be a vet and whether or not you're talking about a vet like a veteran or a vet like a veterinarian either way you may not be cut out for that i am definitely not cut out for either of those i'm not cut out for a lot of things i am cut out to read you words in the dictionary, and then just tell you what I think of them. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Next is cut over one word, adjective from 1899, having most of the saleable timber cut down. Having most of the saleable timber cut down. Cut over. Hmm? All right, yep. The, uh, the, the, the lumberjacks... And there's other words for that. The timber people use this. We got it. We got to cut wood uh, sustainably, though. Please and thank you. Next is cut price. Two words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1910. This is chiefly British, and the synonym is cut rate, which we will get soon. Uh, but yeah, cut rate, cut price. Next is cut purse. One word, noun from the 14th century. Ah, the synonym is pickpocket. A cut, so, so, oh, I bet you this came from back in the day. Somebody would literally cut the strap to a lady's purse or somebody's purse. And uh, then it became pickpocket because then they started keeping things in their pocket. And they got, they, the, the pocket had to get picked to take, get the stuff out of there but it used to be cut purse. Stop that cut purse. Is that what they would say? Or Yeah, maybe. Do, 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 do. Next is cut rate, two words, with a hyphen. Adjective from 1904. One, marked by, offering, or making use of a reduced rate or price, as in cut rate stores. They've slashed their prices. Um, and yeah, so uh, similarly, there would be cut price stores in the British areas. Cut price. Either way, it makes sense. The price or the rate has been cut. Two, synonyms are second rate and cheap. It might be second rate, it might be cheap, or, you know, they're just trying to get prices more more better for people. <laughs> Next is cuttable. Adjective from the 15th century. Capable of being cut. Ready for cutting. As in, cuttable timber. That timber was probably cut down and it is ready for cutting into boards. Do, 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 do. Next is cutter, C-U-T-T-E-R, noun from the 15th century, one, one that cuts. Like 1A, one whose work is cutting or involves cutting. 1B1, an instrument, machine, machine part, or tool that cuts. 1B2, a device for vibrating a cutting stylus in disc recording. And then also the stylus or its point. I was just thinking about this. Uh, this device for bright. So this would be a. Uh, I think this would be like on a record. It has to be cut out. Well, I guess those are those are uh, smashed. They're printed. They're uh, they're they're pressed. Um, but back in the day, there were these wax cylinders 
that were it would spin and the vibrations would go through this cutting stylus thing and it would cut little little lines little wavy lines into the into the the wax and it just blows my mind that on a record or the wax cylinder or something physical like that it just is amazes me that all of this sound information can be in those little grooves i just don't fully understand how and why you can get this whole range of frequencies and everything in those it's just it's mind-boggling that somebody figured out that they could even do that uh but yeah that's very cool it's a cutter it cuts in to put a vibrating cutting stylus okay back to 2a for cutter a ship's boat for carrying stores or passengers. To be a single-masted fore and aft rigged sailing vessel. So uh, it's a little a little hard to understand. I think if you're not reading it. So it's a sailing vessel. It is has one mast, and it is rigged fore and aft. F O R E hyphen and A N D hyphen aft. A single mast, fore and aft rigged sailing vessel. Hope that made sense because it didn't make sense to me. To see a small armed vessel in government service. Three, a light sleigh, like the, like a sleigh, like you go down the snow in a sleigh. It's a cutter because it's cutting through the snow. Well, my throat is getting a little raw, so we're almost done, but that's appropriate because I will say, do 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 cut throat. My throat feels like it's being cut from all this talking. Number one, a first form for cut throat, noun from 1535. Number one, the synonyms are killer and murderer. Literally, maybe somebody who is cutting the throats of other people. This is just not a nice thing to do. Did I even need to say that? Don't think so. If you feel like you want to cut the throat of somebody, maybe go talk to a therapist first. I think that would be good. Number two, a cruel, unprincipled person is cutthroat. They're not necessarily hurting or killing anybody, but they are cruel and they don't have any principles they just, it's just a lot of, a lot of greed maybe there. They're cutthroat. Do, 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 do. Second form of cutthroat. Adjective from 1565. Number one, the synonyms are murderous and cruel. Number two, marked by unprincipled practices. Synonym is ruthless, as in cutthroat competition three characterized by each player playing independently rather than having a permanent partner and this is used especially of partnership games adapted for three players as in cutthroat bridge you just you're just all by yourself you got to be selfish in this case cutthroat it's like you're willing to cut the throats metaphorically of the people that you are against. One more word for this episode. Do 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 Cut throat contract. Two words. Noun from circa 1944. Contract bridge in which partnerships are determined by the bidding. And then it becomes very cutthroat. Teams against teams, people against people. All right, so the words in this episode were cut off, cut off, cut off man, cut out, cut out, cut out, cut over, cut price, cut purse, cut rate, cuttable, cutter, cutthroat, cutthroat, and cutthroat contract. Hmm. None of these really jumped out at me. I Maybe I'll just pick, uh, let's see. Maybe, maybe I'll do cut purse because it was an old form of pickpocket that I wasn't aware of, and I thought that that was kind of interesting. It was a good, a good old English thing for me to learn. I, it's not like it's going to be helpful to my life in any way, but it was just something new that I didn't know about. 
don't go cutting people's purses because they want their purses and you can't have it. Don't be a cut purse or a pickpocket. Yeah. That's going to be it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening to this again and again and again and again and again and again. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is, of course, if you don't know already, this is the podcast where I, Spencer, read short sections of the dictionary and I comment on them, and it's a whole lot of fun. Um, And of course, as you may have seen in the title, this is a very special episode because we have a guest. Again, it's not very common, but it does happen. Um, We have today Sarah, and I think I'm going to pronounce it correctly, McAnulty. Did I get it right? Yes, that's exactly right. Excellent. So um, I learned about Sarah from listening to the podcast called Ologies, which I have mentioned many times on this show because it is my favorite podcast. Uh, It's better than mine. And I said, I, you know, I need to have experts on my show to talk about certain things. I have years and years to go, so I might as well start gathering them now. And this worked out perfectly because Sarah... Mostly, as I, I'll let you give your whole bio, but as far as I know, she is a squid expert, but also knows quite a lot about cuttlefish. And I was getting very, very close to cuttlefish. So I said, hey, I need an expert. So Sarah, can you please tell the people who you are, what you do, and all of the awesome things about you? Absolutely. So hi, I'm Sarah McNulty. I am absolutely a squid expert. I also um, am the executive director of a nonprofit called Skype a Scientist. And we match up scientists with anybody who wants to talk to a scientist. That could be a classroom. It could be a scout troop. It could be a library, an artist, a journalist, anybody who needs a scientist in their life to have a conversation. We are here to help them out with that. We also run trivia nights every Thursday. So right after we finished recording this podcast, I'll start a trivia night. And um, we do public art. We do all kinds of stuff to try to connect people with science in creative ways. Um, And of course, I just love squid more than anything. And so any experience uh, that I get talking uh, about squid with people, I take it. That is awesome. And of course, uh, you know, I I believe I heard that uh, you you have an amazing car that of the photo went viral, that your car is covered in, you know, Skype a scientist. If you want to know anything about squids, ask a question, text. What's the what's the is their phone number? Yes, that is the squid mobile. And uh, on the back windshield, it says, uh, want a squid fact? Text squid to one eight three three psi text, which translates to one eight three three seven two four eight three nine eight. Awesome. And yeah, I will put all of her information in the show notes. So I strongly recommend that you go check out all of her social media, Skype a scientist and all that. And everybody needs to learn more about squids. So, but oh yeah, to, of course. Uh, but today, uh, in the middle of this episode is the best word in this episode. We're going to talk about cuttlefish because that's the thing that she knows about in this group of words. And maybe maybe she knows a little bit about some of these other ones too. Um, so we are going to get into it with our first word, which is cutthroat trout. Uh, yes, it's okay. Let's see what this is. It is a noun from circa 1891. It is a large spotted trout, chiefly of northwestern North America, that has reddish streaks on the intugament of the lower jaw, and it is called also just cutthroat. So I got to imagine that with these reddish streaks, it looks like it's uh, bleeding, like it had its throat had been cut. So that's why they call it a cutthroat trout. And the species name, I will try to say this, it is Oncorhynchus or Oncorhynchus. Clarky, and there's another one, Salmo Clarky. Uh, you probably have a lot more experience with these uh, species or scientific names. Did I do okay? I'll, I'm just looking for okay. I mean, okay is, uh, I can definitely give you the okay on that. Definitely <laughs> did okay. I admittedly do not know a lot about freshwater fish in general. Um, they often, unless it's like very obvious, I have no idea what it is. Uh, marine fish I do a little bit better and then squid obviously I know exactly what I'm talking about but the freshwater fish tend to elude me so um, this is admittedly the first time I'm hearing about a cutthroat trout Uh, sounds pretty cool though 
yeah, I wa- uh, I'll probably post a picture of one of these on Instagram because I want to see what this looks like. Also, Twitter. Um, yeah, I'm not a I'm not a fish guy. I don't go fishing, nothing like that. So um, I find this uh, just I just want to see what it looks like. I'm looking at one right now, and it totally does look like like very red right around the gill area. So that checks out. That is very cool. Um, so I uh, I have been doing little sound effects in between each word just to sort of designate where the uh, you know the next word is going to start. Do you have any suggestions of a sound effect that we should do? Maybe um, a bubbles or a splash. Okay, I'll try. I'll try some bubbles. Let's say just something stupid like. Sounds great. Perfect. Okay, so the next word is cut time. This is two words. Noun from 1951. And it is duple or quadruple time with the beat represented by a half note. And this is in music. Uh, I can sort of I can sort of think about it in my head. I've, I have a little bit, little bit of experience. Um, I think if a, if a song is going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, but then you cut it in half, one, two, three, four. That would be cut time. That's probably not the best description. What's your uh, musical knowledge like? Oh boy, not very good. I played <laughs> guitar for a very, very long time, and then I broke my hand twice playing water polo in a year, and that was the end of that. Uh, and even then, I didn't. I never really learned how to use like read music. So I'm one of the worst musicians I've ever met. Um, <laughs> but uh, what do you, I love karaoke. Does that count? That totally counts. Yeah. I think right. cut time is used a lot in karaoke. I think karaoke is a lot of fun too. <laughs> so maybe someday there will be some karaoke in our future. Beautiful. Uh, but yeah, cut time, you know, it's a half note. It's slower. That's all you need to know. Moving on to the first form of the word cutting, C-U-T-T-I-N-G, noun from the 14th century. Number one, something cut or cut off or out as 1a a plant section originating from stem leaf or root and capable of developing into a new plant 1b the synonym is just harvest yeah when you go harvest the things you're gonna cut them gotta go do some cuttings number two something made by cutting especially the number four definition for the word record and you've you've heard people say cut a record. I gotta go cut a record. So I think that's what that one is. Um, I don't know. Do you, I, I don't really know plants. Uh, but yeah, if you cut off a piece of plant, it's uh, going to be a cutting. Do you do you plant? I do. Garden? I it, well, not really in the backyard. My backyard is uh, I live, live in Philadelphia. It's a concrete slab, so we don't really yeah. have much in the way of plants outside of like little pots going on back there but in my office my office is covered in house plants and they're mostly like the very hardy uh easy to keep alive vine type mm-hmm. and i'm always making cuttings of those and planting them in new pots um so yeah that is a common uh thread through my life nice yeah i've heard about those plants you just cut a little piece off and you can replant it and it grows i it just, just think grows. that's amazing yeah, it's like shockingly easy. It'll just do, do it. Do you just do you give those away to other people? I so my I have a chameleon in my office. His name is Mark, and Mark really <laughs> likes to eat the species of plants that I have. Um, and so Mark will eat them, and then I just keep planting more, and he keeps eating them, and uh, it's a beautiful kind of homeostasis of plants. Yeah, that's the per- that's what you want for an environment. It's just self-sustaining, like those little exactly. uh, the bottles that everything it needs is, is right in there. Yep, that's uh, my office for sure. I got to know the name Mark for a chameleon. Where did that come from? I agonized over naming this chameleon. I and it was it was tough because my best friend at the time was dating this guy named Mark and I felt like I shouldn't name it name my chameleon Mark because I didn't have complete faith um that that man mark would be staying around for a very long time yeah. um but the chameleon was just giving me like he was just giving me mark vibes like i felt like he was very obviously a mark and i was like you know what i just have to and i tried calling him other things I, he was nameless for like two weeks and then i was on a zoom call with a bunch of people and they were like oh what's that i was like oh it's my chameleon what's his name and i was like uh mark <laughs> and i was like well shit that's that's his name now his name is mark there's nothing there's nothing i can do about it he just happens to be named Mark. It's out well, of my between, hands. 
between the vibes and you were put under pressure on the Zoom call, it's just that's, that's it's what just, happened. That's just how it happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on to the next word. It is the second form of cutting. Adjective from the 15th century, one. Given to or designed for cutting, especially the synonyms sharp and edged. Number two, marked by sharp, piercing, cold, as in cutting winds. You probably get those in, in Philadelphia. I definitely get those in Chicago, those cutting winds. Yes, harkens back to my time living in New England. Oh, even Cut worse, probably. Yeah, for sure. Uh, number three, inclined or likely to wound the feelings of others, especially because of a ruthless, <laughs> a ruthless incisive uh no what is that word incisiveness no incisiveness that's it goes over to the second line so it's a little hard to read but that is not a word i'm familiar with anyway we have an example a cutting remark and i'm sure we have all experienced a cutting remark at some point i spend uh, too much time on twitter so that's just oh, cutting remarks all day long on twitter <laughs> you can't avoid them just hurting my feelings for no reason every day <laughs> You have to grow such a thick skin to be on any sort of public thing like this, YouTube, Twitter, whatever it is. Yes. Uh, number four, the synonyms are intense and piercing, as in a cutting pain. And cuttingly is an adverb. Anything hmm. else about cutting, the adjective? I think I'm fresh out of cutting associated things. Yeah. It's like I, I can only associate a word in my life so much, and I think they, they got it all there. So moving on. We have cutting board. Two words, noun from 1639. I got to believe that almost everybody has experiences with a cutting board. It is a board on which something, as food or cloth, is placed for cutting. <laughs> I, I love these definitions. It's, it's just exactly what it is. And I, that is what I it don't is. know. Yeah. Um, often, you know, um, have to cut up veggies, whatever it is. It's, it's cutting boards get used a lot in these households, uh, this household. What about you? Oh, all the time. I'm yeah. using cutting boards every day around here. Um, do you have to cut up things for Mark the Chameleon? No, Mark the Chameleon mostly eats... Um, like roaches and mealworms who he likes to eat fully alive. So oh. no need to cut those. And then he usually eats the plants when they're still alive too. So he's a real predator over there, that Mark. Uh, not yeah. really any uh, cut food for him. Your job is very easy when it comes to feeding him. It's true. He really takes care of himself. I should have had you on the episode for Chameleon. Too late. Oh my God. Alas. <laughs> um, yeah, cutting board. I don't know. We just have those like cheap plastic ones. I should probably get like a nice wood one, but I don't know. I have like very cheap bamboo-ish ones that work just fine, but are all warped. They've been through hell. Oh, um, yeah. But like, you know, I, I don't want to buy a new one because I have one and it's, right. it works. So it's fine by me. It's not broke. Don't fix it. Exactly. That's a very bad bubble. <laughs> next, next, we have cutting edge. Two words noun from 1804 one a sharp effect or quality two the foremost part or place and the synonym is vanguard cutting edge with a hyphen is an adjective so um yeah i think typically we think of this as being at least the way i think of it is the thing that's that's in the front um it's the 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 uh, like technology the Te bleeding the, the edge cutting? of technology yeah yeah, bleeding edge is the other way to say that. Um, what is brand new? And when it comes to that and technology, I feel like I just can't keep up. It's always changing. We we are um, we are evolving so quickly as a human species, especially when it comes to technology. That it's just there's so much happening every day. I just feel left behind. Oh, that's a that's a, a somewhat sad way of thinking of it, though. I can certainly. Uh... <laughs> understand that feeling um yeah it's hard to That's keep up I, is what i'm I saying i spend too much time on social media because i'm trying to keep up with what's going on at all times on all fronts and it's very hard it is it is i i have a couple news podcasts i scroll twitter a little bit not as much as 
Well, I was going to say not as much as I should, but I think no, a lot of people dead. would. The, if you don't do it at all, that's as much as you should because yeah. uh, it's not good for your brain. But mm. yeah. I try and just create stuff like this in my free time, which of course is much better than doom scrolling Twitter. For sure. Uh, okay. Next is cutting horse. I hope mm. no horses are being cut here. This what's What is this? It is two words. Noun from 1881. It is an agile saddle horse trained to separate individual animals from a cattle herd. Uh, oh, okay. So, you know, uh, cowboys are using this when they're dealing with their cows. And it sounds like this horse knows how to cut a cow from the herd, it sounds like, or certain ones. Is that Does that make sense to you? Sure. I would have always thought you'd want to keep all your cows together, but yeah. you know, I just don't know the first thing about being a farmhand. So uh, what do I know? Uh, the same like, that I know. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe if a horse, uh, no, uh, if a cow is injured or something, maybe they want to separate it. Uh, yeah, there's got to be reasons, but I, I don't know. About everything I know from that is watching the power of the dog recently. Yeah. Um, yep, that's a cutting horse. Cool. Next, we have cutting room. Oh man, that bubble sound, it's reminding me of Finding Nemo when oh my there, God, yeah. there's that one fish that's just all crazy about bubbles. Uh-huh. Uh, okay, we have cutting room, two words, noun from 1918. It is a room where film or videotape is edited and it is often used attributive, attributively in the phrase cutting room floor to describe something removed or discarded in or as if in editing a film. Um, I actually do video editing as my day job. Um, I learned a little bit on film. So that this is we're talking more about specifically film because you literally would cut something out and put it on the floor or in a bin. Um, but of course, as we've gotten to digital, that's not happen happening anymore. Um, but yeah, now we just use it to say something has been left discarded. It's on the cutting room floor. And uh, I, I have memories of cutting this film out and like, am I going to need it? Am I, I don't want to throw it out. What do I do with it? But, you know, for, for decades, that's what people were doing. Uh, do you have any experience with editing or just this phrase, cutting room floor? I've definitely used and heard the phrase cutting room floor yeah. in my life but i um thankfully have never had to edit film like physical film just yeah. on like you know digital thankfully but that sounds stressful also what if like i don't know i spilled my coffee on it that sounds so so scary oh, yeah i just always yeah. think about the the scene in inglorious bastards where they light the whole theater on fire with mm. that super flammable film oh yes <laughs> You got to keep all the flames away from the film, that old celluloid. And yeah, they must have had rules in edit, uh, at like edit rooms to like no liquids at all. Right. Please keep it away. Um, yeah, I'm glad that I got a little little experience editing on film in college, uh, but I'm glad that that was not <laughs> what I had to do for my whole career. For sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next, we have. Cuddle bone. So this is actually, you know, this is a little bit of a preamble into our real, real important word. So this, this is where Sarah's expertise comes into play. Cuddle bone, one word, noun from 1547. Um, and if people don't know, I will quickly spell it. C-U-T-T-L-E-B-O-N-E. -E. This is the shell of a cuttlefish that is sometimes used for polishing powder or for supplying cage birds with lime and salts. That's right. Did the dictionary get it right? I mean, that's not incorrect, yeah. but that's not what the cuttlefish is using it for. Like all we mentioned in this definition is what humans use cuttle bones for and that it comes from a cuttlefish, but cuttle bones are actually incredibly cool because they, so they're made of aragonite, which is like a calcium um, bicarbonate, uh, a version of that um, and they're inside the animal so they're like it, it it serves as the kind of back structure of the animal and it's also a buoyancy device and 
cuttlefish can control what the buoyancy of the cuttle bone is, and they do gas exchange across their blood so that they can either make themselves float up a little bit more or sink a little bit more. Um, but really what they want to do is maintain what's called neutral buoyancy so that they neither float nor sink depending on where they are in the water. So if they're going into deeper water, they're going to do some gas exchange across that cuddle bone to make it neutrally buoyant for that depth. Um, and also cuddle bones are really cool to look at because as the animal gets bigger, they're adding layers of it. Kind of like imagine if you cut a tree in half and you see the tree rings, yeah. it looks just like that, but in internal shell type thing. They're really, really cool. And just the fact that they're fed to birds is like so, such a small part of their cool factor. Yeah. Um, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, oh yeah, okay, I guess that's how humans have experience with these things, but that's so such a small part of what this thing is. Um, the fact that animals, you know, all animals are different. They all have their own biology. And so the, in this one example, the fact that they can consciously change the gas in their bloodstream to change their buoyancy just blows my mind whenever I hear things about that, like that, um, that animals can do these things that to a human just sounds like a superpower. Yeah. I wonder, I think it's more like the way our heart rate changes when we need more blood flow. I don't know sure. if it's like they're deciding consciously yeah. to change. There are things that cuttlefish do consciously, like I think change um, their skin color. Mm. Um, that's more of a conscious decision um, in some circumstances. But the gas exchange, I think, is just like one of these really cool things that their body just like does. Just right. like your eye pupil opens and closes with light changes, like wild. Yeah, it just thinks like, I just need to do this thing right now. And it just mm -hmm. happens. It just does it. Yeah. Yeah. Biology also is just crazy insane. Um, I thought there was something else I was good, but yeah. Oh, okay. uh, and how do, not that this is the most fun topic, but how do they get these cuddle bones for, uh, cage birds? It, are, I hope they're not harvesting cuddle fish. They are, but people are usually eating the cuttlefish too. So it's not like they're pulling the cuttle bone out and then just like chucking the cuttlefish yeah, back that into makes the sense. ocean. Um, there, it's like a use every part of the animal type situation. Um, but yeah, cuttlefish are really commonly eaten in lots and lots of places all over the world. We don't eat it in the United States so much because no cuttlefish live here. So mm. if cuttlefish lived in North America, we'd probably be eating a lot more cuttlefish than we currently do. Yeah, that makes sense. I won't be eating any, but I understand some people will. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to get to our next word. That's the sound of the gas in the bloodstream going into the cuddle bone. No, that probably doesn't make any sounds. So we have cuttlefish, noun from circa 1828. Any of various marine cephalopod mollusks having eight short arms and two usually longer tentacles and differing from the related squid in having a calcified internal shell, which of course we were just talking about that. Real quick, I will say that the order name is, I hope I say it correctly, Sepioidea, Se uh, maybe? Sepioidea. And say that again? Sepioidea. And then also the genus is Sepia, which looks like, I assume it's Sepia and not Sepia, right? So sepia, the ink, comes from cuttlefish. So it's totally oh. the same thing. Yeah. Oh, wow. See, this is why I have experts on this show. Exactly, yeah. Um, this is from Middle English, kotul, C-O-T-U-L, and then also just the English word fish. Um, and do you have any other etymology information for this other than that? Well, first of all, I can't believe that it says that this word came about in 1824. Like, that's late. Like, what the heck were we calling cuttlefish before 1824? Right. <laughs> that's weird to think about. 1824 is not that long ago, all things considered. Um, really makes me wonder. I don't know what we were calling. Because cuttlefish live around England. So it would be in English-speaking places. So... I think with that, I think before 1828, it was probably using that Middle English word, kotul, or Kotal. however they pronounce it. Yeah, uh -huh. I have n I know, have no knowledge about Middle English. But yeah, I feel like bef before that, maybe there was something else. I don't know. Um, 
I mean, maybe but, they just uh, called them squid or something. That's possible because they because in in German, um, generally speaking, squid and cuttlefish are just called tintin fish, like tint, like uh, oh. inky sort of. So tintin fish, um, and so there's not really like there's a word for octopus, kraken, kraka, <laughs> and then um, a word for cuttlefish and squid, tintin fish, and I don't really. I, I like tried to find a translation for cuttlefish and I really couldn't find one when I was living in Germany. So, um, mm. yeah, but tintin fish also covers the like cephalopods in general. That's also Kopffusser. So, uh, Kopf means head, Fusser means foot. So it's just like cephalopod, head, foot, same, same thing, thing yeah. just German. Yeah. So the Kopffusser are. The cephalopods, tintin fish are, I don't know why we're talking in German, but I have this knowledge. I might as well share it with you. This is um, where this podcast goes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the tintin fish are the the cuttlefish and squid, and then kraka are the octopuses, auf Deutsch. Germans need to get on having a, a, a very specific word for cuttlefish. That's my opinion. Um, yes. What, what else do you want to tell us about cuttlefish since we're, since we're here? There's, I mean, cuttlefish I could talk about, honestly, for an entire hour. They're so, so cool. What's cool about cuttlefish um, is that they're pretty easy to find um, in, in the wild when you're not in North America or South America because yeah. they live pretty uh, in pretty shallow water. They live relatively close uh, to the coasts. And so they hang out where humans are also hanging out. They can change color as quickly as they can think about it because the color changing structures in their skin um, are called chromatophores and they are um, each directly linked to the brain. So they can change as quickly as the animal can think about it. They also have the ability to change their texture with basically like extreme goosebumps, those goosebumps called uh, papillae. Um, and so there are like little muscles that can change their texture like pretty extremely, particularly in a couple species, including the giant Australian cuttlefish, which are, the, as the name implies, the biggest cuttlefish that there is, and of course live in Australia. Um, these cuttlefish are incredibly brightly colored. They're blue and purple and black and pink and white. They're amazing. Um, they're massive. They change color incredibly quickly. Um, and they have the papillae right behind their eyes that can really quickly like almost look like eyebrows like sticking up really fast and it's very cool to watch um and they also do this this thing called passing cloud so um as i said they they can change color as quickly as they can think about it and they do all sorts of wacky things with that ability they um signal what they what their intentions are with uh, their fellow cuttlefish. They can use it, of course, for camouflage, but they can also use it to just like confuse the heck out of prey. And uh, passing cloud is often used for this. So they will move black bars of color across their body and they end up looking a bit like a hypnotist's wheel. It looks really freaky and visually overwhelming. Um, and they often hold their arms out to either side of their head um, and sort of approach their prey. And uh, the scale difference is imagine like a VW bus sized thing floating above your head, approaching you in a hypnotist wheel. Like you'd be like, what is happening? And then next thing you know, you'd be eaten by a cuttlefish. So um, they're just really amazing animals. And uh, I recommend everybody go on YouTube and just lose an hour uh, watching cuttlefish videos. Yeah, that sounds pretty easy to do. Uh, the the uh, giant Australian cuttlefish; those are as big as a VW bus. No, no, no. Uh, relative a, size. A to a human. Relative size Got to it. a human. So, uh, if we were crab sized, yeah, they would be VW bus size. They are like a meter long, so nowhere near VW bus size. But the crabs they're eating are much smaller than us. Yeah, but still, a meter. That's that's a very large. That's a big <laughs> animal. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, we have a picture here of a cuttlefish. Um, would you like to just briefly sort of visually describe what it looks like? Sure. Imagine like a rugby ball with a bed skirt around the outside, <laughs> um, with a face and some arms. So they've got a cute little face with big, 
goobery eyes that have w-shaped pupils and then they have eight arms sticking out of that big face their eyes are very expressive um and big and cute and then behind that face with the arms out the front they have effectively their torso which is what we call their mantle um that's the rugby ball portion of their body um it's kind of pointed toward the back Um, And they have a fin that goes all the way around their bodies. There are really two fins that are separated in the back by one little separation point, but it pretty much looks like one big fin all the way around. And they undulate that fin for like fine scale movements um, in smaller areas. And then they use jet propulsion um, to really jet quicker. And jet propulsion is where they take a really, really deep breath in into their torso and then close off their like breathing in uh, areas and then squirt all of that water out of a very small funnel. Um, And that's how they kind of generate that force to shoot themselves backward very quickly. Um, So that's what a cuttlefish looks like. When they do this jet propulsion, is the the little hole that it's coming out or the funnel, is it in the back? So they're shooting forward? Right under their chin basically so it's like okay. right under their eyes um under their face under their head so it shoots them backwards basically exactly it shoots them backwards for sure yeah 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 i feel like i've seen squid do that as well right Mm-hmm. for yeah. sure yep okay. and octopuses do the exact same thing mm. Um, we obviously have to post, uh, pictures of cuttlefish on social media. And, uh, like she said, go out, maybe find some YouTube links, which I will put in the show notes. Uh, but these sound like really fascinating animals. I've, I really have an appreciation for the cephalopods, the animals that can camouflage and change their shape and are also incredibly smart. Uh, Mm -hmm. it just, it just blows my mind that these things exist in the first place and i i think it's so cool to learn about them yes they're the best well um obviously you know (laughs) you could talk about that for hours and i could ask you questions about them for hours um and we will i think have to have you back for the squid episode whenever i get to that in years from now um but we we have a handful of more words for this episode which we will get to and i know that you have a trivia thing to get to so we will. I'll make. We'll make it. Sounds good. Our next word. It is Cuddy Sark. Two words. Noun from seventeen seventy nine. This is chiefly Scottish. And is this a an alcohol? A whiskey? Do you know? I feel like I've heard it. I was thinking it was a ship. I. What is it? Um. I think that it also is reminding me um, of a rap artist. <laughs> Cuddy. No, Cuddy Sark. C-U-T-T-Y-S-A-R-K is a ship. It is a ship. It's a British clipper ship. Okay, I can't believe I got that right. You know what? It might also be like a rum or something named after the ship. That is probably ringing a bell. That makes sure. sense. And they probably have a picture of the ship on the label. Oh my God, you're right. It's scotch. And there is a picture of a Cuddy Sark ship on the label. Yep. See, we're all we were right both right. Situation. Yep. We yep, know yep. what we're talking about. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, But that's not what the dictionary says. It says it is a short garment, especially a woman's short undergarment. Hmm. Uh, And cuddy. Dubious. Yeah. um, In English dialect, cuddy means short. Uh, So that's what that is. I don't know what sort of undergarment we're talking about. I could theorize. I'm not going to. But now we know (laughs) that it is uh, a short undergarment. It is a ship. It is a scotch and maybe other things. All of the above. Yeah. Uh, you need the context to know what we're talking about. All right. Next we have cuddy stool. Two words. Noun from 1820. Again, chiefly Scottish. And again, cuddy means short in this context because number one, it is a low stool. That one is chiefly Scottish. Number two, though, is not Chiefly Scottish, don't worry, we'll get there. It is a seat in a Scottish church where offenders formerly sat for public rebuke. I don't know why it didn't say it is chiefly Scottish because it sounds like it is definitely Scottish. So it's probably just a low stool that they sat on where people could (laughs) yell at them because they did something offensive. Wow. In a church, no less. Yikes. Well... If it's anything like my experience with Catholicism, guilt should definitely be involved with religion. So that checks out. 
Absolutely. You, f- you feel guilty. People are going to make you feel guilty while you're sitting on the cuddy stool. Maybe you're wearing a cuddy sark at the same time. There you go. I don't even know what happened to the sound effect. <laughs> we have cut up. C-U-T-U-P. This is one word. Noun from 1843. It is a person who clowns or acts boisterously. Uh, were you ever the, a cut up in school or just with your friends or family? Um, in some circumstances, not in grade school, but I always admired the cut ups of the classroom in grade school. Um, now I feel like uh, the cut up of science. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's a good a good position to be in. Um, I think so. Yeah. Same for me. I kind of always wanted to be the cut up. I like telling jokes and making people laugh, but I was always too shy to be that person really. Uh, so yeah, I kind of looked up to them. Um, and I, I have to imagine that they're called a cut up because I think that's maybe a phrase for laughing or yeah. you make people cut up. Um, but maybe our next word uh, will give us a little bit more information. It is cut up again, but this one is two words. So it is a verb from uh, 1580. We are starting with transitive. 1A, to cut into parts or pieces. And you might use a cutting board for that. 1B, to injure or damage by or as if by cutting. And the synonym is, uh, two synonyms, gash and slash. Oh boy. Uh, I don't like those. Because that mm-hmm. makes me think I have a cut on my arm or something. No, thank you. Number two, to subject to hostile criticism. And the synonym is censure. Uh, now we have intransitive, two of those. Number one, to undergo being cut up. Ooh, again, nope, don't like that. <laughs> Unless it's like cut up, like uh, made fun of in a pleasant uh like friend situation right Um, that will be an acceptable cut up made fun of or laughing or something that i approve of number two to behave in a comic boisterous or unruly manner and the synonym is clown unruly did they need to put that in there i guess so But yeah, I, I, it's it's fun. It's just fun to clown around and be goofy, which I hope you all realize I'm a fan of that from this podcast. Yes. Bloop. Next word is cut water. And this is one word. Noun from 1644. The forepart of a ship's stem. Do you know the parts of a ship? You know, I don't know the parts of a ship. I know some parts of some ships but I don't know the parts of like old timey ships for yeah. sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, ships cut through water. That's a thing. So uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah, that 100% makes sense. You need that sort of sharp angle, sharp-ish angle to cut through the water. And uh, I have to also imagine that the Cuddy Sark, this was related to that in some way, the, the ship uh, why it's called a Cuddy Sark. Maybe I'll do some more uh, research and put it in the show notes about why they called that ship the Cuddy Sark, but I have to imagine it's something about cutting through water. I bet. I have to ask, in, uh, in, in, in the Ologies episode that you were on, which just replayed a few days, uh, like a week before we're recording this, um, Ali mentioned your pronunciation of the word water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, what, what were your thoughts when she mentioned that? <laughs> I mean, I've gotten made fun of for the way I pronounce water for a very long time. I grew up in Philadelphia. I live in Philadelphia now, um, but I spent, you know, 12 years outside of Philadelphia uh, in, yeah. in undergrad and then grad school. And those little monsters in Connecticut that I taught introductory bio to, like the first lab that I, I took them through was like learning how to use this device called a spectrophotometer where like, you know, you put stuff. You put like liquid in tubes and you put the tube in the machine and then it reads whatever the like the amount of light that's absorbed by the liquid, Um, which is useful for a lot of lab things. But for that lab was actually pretty, you know, pretty boring. But anyway, I had to say water like, I don't know, 20 times in the introductory lecture and they couldn't handle it. Like every year they'd be like, where are you from? It's like, obviously I'm from Philadelphia. Right. The best, greatest city in the world. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. You know, people from all over the place, they say words differently. It's it's fun to sort of, 
you know, make fun of it sometimes or comment on it, but you know, yeah, it doesn't just... really bother me. I've gotten very used to it. You know, you can make fun of the way I say water as many times as you like. I don't, I don't care. Uh, but I really did like Allie's uh, like breakdown of like of Philadelphia English. I didn't really know a lot of that. So I learned <laughs> about my own accent listening to that podcast. Yeah. That's one of the greatest things. She just digs in. She gets. She researches. She gets into the information just because she's interested, and of course, everybody else is too, or whether they like it or not. Yeah. Um, all right. Next word. We have cut work. One word. Noun from the 15th century. Embroidery, usually on linen, in which a design is outlined in buttonhole stitch and the enclosed material cut away. I, mm. I don't do anything with fabrics or yarns. Do you have experience? I embroider in the winter when there are no bugs outside for me to go find. Um, but I don't know, fabric, you know, I don't really do a lot with, but I put thread through fabric in a little uh, bamboo circle a lot. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it makes sense. The name, it's cut work. You're working on something and then you cut away the excess material. So it's, uh, it's not the most clever name, but it is very descriptive, which I like. That's right. All right. We have one more for this episode. It is cut worm. Again, one word. Yeah. C-U-T-W-O-R-M. Noun from 1816. I mean, before I even read the definition, I have to say, you know, you hear that you could cut a worm in two and it's going to regrow and then you're going to have two worms. Whether or not this is related to that, I don't know, but I hope it is. Well, here we go. We'll find out. Any of various smooth-bodied, chiefly nocturnal, noctuid moth caterpillars, which often feed on young plant stems near ground level. So near ground level, that makes sense. People are going to call them a worm. Uh, it doesn't say anything about why it's called cut worm, though. So maybe we need to post a picture of this. So maybe there's like lines in it that look like it's been cut. Do you think uh, that it leaves marks on the leaves that look like what it would look like if you cut fabric? That would make sense. Or just make little lines like, you know, as they're eating the leaf, maybe they look like cut lines. Yeah. Uh, so many possibilities. Um, they're nocturnal. Noctuid, I think, I mean, it's, it seems a little redundant to put nocturnal and noctuid in here, but I don't know enough about the term noctuid, but I'm sure there's a reason. I've never even heard that word before. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the word diurnal, which is, I think it just, I think we're diurnal. I think, you know, sleep in the we day. Are. Yeah. But yeah, those weird, there's those weird words. I come across them all the time. I'm like, I don't know what this is yet. Hmm. Um. Feed on young plant stems. Yeah, they probably little cut lines in there. Um, that's it. There is no etymology for that one. So I don't know if I told you this, but we now have to pick a word of the episode. And by we, I mean you. So I will quickly just reread them. I think I know what you're probably going to pick. but I, we I have, have a sense of which one I'll pick, yeah. Cutthroat trout, cut time, cutting, cutting, cutting board, cutting edge, Cutting horse, cutting room, cuddle bone, cuddle fish, cuddle sark, cutty sark, cutty stool, cut up, cut up, cut water, cut work, and cut worm. We got to go with cuddlefish. Come on. Of course cuddle we fish do. Cuddlefish are the best. I, you know, I almost picked cuddle bone, but at the end of the day, I just couldn't do it because cuddlefish are so cool and have cuddle bones in them. Exactly. Cuddle, cuddle bone is encompassed literally in the cuttlefish. Uh, exactly. you're, a, you're a fan of karaoke. Would you like to sing a two-second song about cuttlefish? Oh, I better not, but thank you so much for offering. <laughs> no problem. I'll, I'll just sing, cuttlefish are really cool. Let's go learn about cuttlefish. And Beautiful. that's the song. That's I just put a, put a song at the end somewhere or sometimes in the middle. Um, Great. Uh, this has been amazing to talk to you. I learned a lot. Um, I always love getting this dialogue with somebody else on these episodes. I think it's so much more interesting. Uh, it just adds another level to this. So I really appreciate it. Um, would you like to shout out some of your your plugs, social media, anything like that? Absolutely. You can follow me on all social media platforms that I'm aware of at Sarah Mac Attack. That's S-A-R-A-H-M-A-C-K attack. Um, 
And I run a program called Skype a Scientist. You can get matched with a scientist for free for you, your family, um, your whatever club you happen to be in um, for free. Um, that's skypeascientist.com. Um, you can feel free to text the Squid Facts hotline, which is also totally free at one eight three three 833 text um, There are cuttlefish facts in the Squid Facts hotline as well. So enjoy those. Um, that's really it. I'm also teaching a class on... Um, animal reproduction in June. Um, there'll be four weeks all about weird things animals do when they're mating. Um, you can check that out through Atlas Obscura courses. Those are all of the things that I do. That's very cool. I will say that this episode is airing on June 18th, so we might be a little bit late there, but I that will... will be late. But I will teach I... a class on squid in September of 2022. Oh. So if you want to awesome. learn a lot about cuttlefish, we do a whole week on cuttlefish. Um, and that'll be in yeah September of 2022. And you said that's is that also four weeks? Uh, that'll be five weeks. Oh. I know even more about <laughs> cephalopods than I do about animal reproduction. Um, yeah, also also through Atlas Obscura. Very cool. And yeah, I'll uh, get those links from you, and I'll put those in the show notes as well, so people can easily find that stuff. Perfect. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, of and- course. Until next time, this is Spencer and sometimes somebody else dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Uh, I think this is maybe the first episode I'm recording or the first one that I remembered to say this at least. Um, you may have heard and you if you have actually you probably literally just heard it mere seconds ago. Um, there should be a little piece of music playing at the beginning of these episodes now and at the end. Um, currently, I have one piece of music from my friend Tom Mislowski. His information is in the show notes or at least his name is. And um, I should put more information than that, like his website. I hope that's in there. And uh, yeah, I just asked if he wanted to make a little piece of music for me to put at the beginning and the ends of my episodes, and he did. So you have heard it. So thank you, Tom. And go check out his work and his music-making skills. Uh, I, I've reached out to a couple other people, and so maybe maybe I'll get some other theme songs. I'll just rotate through them uh, for each episode and... I won't know which song is going to go with which episode as I record, so I won't be able to call out them specifically, but I'll do I'll do something later to shout them out. Always go check the show notes. Um, in, in the show notes, you will find other information like the fact that my Twitter and Instagram handles are at DictionaryPod, where I post some pictures and things, and so you can see visually what a lot of these things are that we talk about here. And you can email me if you want to say something, uh, which is dictionarypod at gmail.com. Things that you can email me could be a little audio clip of your own theme song. If you want to send me one, go ahead and make one, and I'll put it in if I like it. And, um, you know, you, you know what I mean. If, if, you're, if you're like, if it's something that's not appropriate, I'm not going to put it in. But other than that, there's a good chance I'm going to put it in. Similarly, you can make your own little sound effect, which I will put in a show. And there is a Patreon where you can join because, you know, let's crowdfund this thing. What else? Did I say the Google Voice number? Call. Leave me a message. Say hi. Uh, Go find this on YouTube, all the social media, all the other platforms, the podcast platforms. Just listen to us on every podcast platform you can find. Listen to the same episode multiple times a day, every single day. And uh, there was something else I just thought of, which I totally just forgot about. Oh, you know, share this, subscribe, rate, and review. Go write up a short little review to say how much you love this show. All right, let's talk about the words on this last section of page 309. And uh, in this episode, we're going to do a bit of a letter jump. We're still in the C's, obviously, but we're going to go from C-U to C-V to C-W and then to see why, and we're gonna hang on see why for uh, for a little while. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, nine, like nine, ten, really until the end of the seas. We're gonna be in the see why section. It's like ten and a half episodes. All right, all right, all right, all right. The first word in this episode. Oh, that's the wrong page. <laughs> I almost, I almost skipped ahead accidentally. We have cuvee. 
or cuve, or cu, cuve, cuve, it's a very French way, cuve. It is spelled C-U-V-E-E, and you can spell it without an accent or with an accent on the first E, which is boop, down on the left, up on the right. Noun from 1833, one, it's just bulk wine, but especially wine in casks or vats so blended as to ensure uniformity and marketability. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, it must be kind of a blended wine. Some some wines are just one type of grape, but other wines are a blend. They take a percentage of this grape and a percentage of this grape, which are called varietals. And yeah, you want to make sure that it's blended very well, because if it's not, somebody might get a bottle that's mostly this wine or this this grape, and then somebody else might get a wine that's a different percentage. But you know, you need it to be all consistent. You know, you get each bottle has to be the same, and then you can market it real good. That's the marketability. Number two for cuvee, a blend of still wines used in the production of champagne. Uh, so, uh, champagne. champagne is bubbly. So that's why they have to call out still wines. Still wines are not bubbly, but they are used to make the bubbly. The bubbly champagne, champagne. Uh, yeah, it's just from the French word cuvee, spelled with one E. I don't know why we added another E. Hmm. At the end of this war of the of this letter, we have started. Sharon and I have started to make this a tradition. Uh, if she agrees to it again, where we read, where we do the last episode together, and then we open up a bottle of something bubbly that starts with that letter. So we could either do cava or cuvee, either one. I it might get difficult as we get to some of these other letters to find something, but we will persevere. We will find it. Uh, but yeah, we have a choice to make for this one. All right, the sound effect. Well, since we're talking about a, a bubbly, uh, a bubbly wine, we could just make like a pop sound. Oh man, recently we opened one, and it was a different kind. It wasn't like a typical cork. It was a weird, new fangled thing. And usually, I'm very careful about these. But I took my hand off just for a second, and the thing popped up in the air and uh, could very have easily hit me in the face. Uh, so you have to be careful when you open these up. I was not being careful. Luckily, everything was fine. No injuries, no broken things. But so my sound effect will be, I don't know, pop. Let's just do that. I said it, pop. Next is cuvette. C-U-V-E-T-T-E. Noun from circa 1909. Number, no, uh, okay, it is just a small, often transparent laboratory vessel. And uh, typically, the example of this vessel would be a tube, a, cuv- a cuvette, a cuvette. This is French, diminutive of, well, it's the same word from cuvee, cuve, or cuvee, C-U-V-E. Um, and here it means tub. Now, it didn't... Oh, okay, interesting. I don't know why they didn't say this for the cuvee one. But yeah, if cuve, however you want to pronounce it, if it means tub, then that makes sense for cuvee because it is wine made in these casks or vats or tubs. So that's literally where the word cuvee comes from. I'm sorry to backtrack here, but I I didn't get the information until later. So yeah, cuvee wine is just made in these big old tubs. And then it's also from the Latin cupa. I'm back to cuvette now. Uh, Cupa. I don't know. I don't remember. I mean, it looks like it's cup. I I do kind of remember coming across that in the CUP section. Yeah, it's like a cup, a vessel, a tub. And uh, and there's more at the word hive. Maybe a beehive is kind of like a tub. It's a a bee tub. Um, A a cuvette. Maybe we will post a picture of a cuvette. A... uh, Often transparent tube in a vessel, uh, in a la- in a lab, in a lab. Yeah, pop. Here comes the abbreviation section. The first is CV. Number one, convertible. Number two, cultivar. 
I guess you could, it could be convertible. It could also be cuvette. Maybe it's like a Corvette, which is a convertible. Pop. CV, all caps. One, cardiovascular. And two, curriculum vitae. And uh, vitae, I think that's how you pronounce it. V-I-T-A-E. And uh, I don't, I'm, tr- I'm trying to remember uh, what that one meant. Let's see. Can we find it real quick? I'm in the uh, curriculum vitae is a, a short account of one's career and qualifications prepared typically by an applicant for a position. It's like a, like a resume kind of. Pop. CVA, all caps, one. Oh, that's why they call it your CV. <laughs> yeah, you, you've probably heard people say this. Hey, what's, I'm going to read your CV. What's on your CV? If a guest is introduced, you got to read out their CV. It means curriculum vitae, which is, you know, the stuff that they've done. All right, back to POP, CVA, abbreviation for one, cerebrovascular accident. Something happened to the blood in your head. I think that's pretty much what that means. Cerebrovascular accident. Number two, Columbia Valley Authority. It, the Columbia Valley Authority must be pretty big because it, otherwise it seems very small and specific to be in this book. I mean, in, in Chicago, we have the, the CTA, which is the Chicago Transit Authority. It's another authority. But that's not important enough to be in the dictionary. So what is the Columbia Valley Authority? Maybe we'll put some information in the show notes. Your website, if you have one, is going to get a bunch of hits. Maybe like 40 Pop, CVS, all caps. It is for chorionic villus sampling. Chorionic villus sampling. I think that's what it is. Uh, And I'm pretty sure that the store, CVS, does not stand for chorionic villus sampling. Although if it did, if it did, that would be interesting. Interesting choice. Pop. Now we're in the CW section. Very short. Next up on the CW, it is an abbreviation for clockwise. I mean, I guess technically it could be for counterclockwise as well, but I think that would be CCW. Pop! CW, all caps. Number one, chemical warfare or chemical weapon. Two, chief warrant officer. And that one feels like it really should be CWO, but I guess not. CW is fine. It seems like it's harder to say CW than it is to say just Chief Warrant Officer. It feels like it's about the same energy. Or chemical warfare. Chemical warfare, chemical warfare. CW. W is a hard word to say. Pop, pop. Next is, so this is not an abbreviation, although it sure looks like it to my brain. It's pronounced cum, C-W-M, noun from 1853. It is chiefly British, more specifically Welsh, and it is the number three definition for the word cirque, C-I-R-Q-U-E. And uh, yeah, this is a, uh, a Welsh word, and it means valley. I don't remember what the third definition for cirque was, but I, I have to imagine it's related to a valley of some kind, a cum. You can go back and listen if you want. Pop, pa pop, pop, poop, pop. Here is CWO, all caps. This is the one. Oh, it's in here. Yeah, number one, cash with order, and then number two, chief warrant officer. So you, you chief warrant officers. Or would it be Chief's Warrant Officer? You get two abbreviations. Because you're special. CWT, abbreviation for hundredweight, which is one word, hundredweight. And of course, that must be because the C is uh, the, the cent, cento, or, you know, variations on that, which means a hundred. That's the prefix for hundred. We read that many, 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 many months ago, that whole C-E section. Pop! 
this is now the beginning of the CY section, starting with just CY, all caps, abbreviation for calendar year, January 1st to December 31st, at least here in the States. I think everywhere does the same calendar year, but different countries, different cultures, societies, they have different types of calendars. Uh, You know, a lot of them go by the lunar calendar. So I think the Hebrew calendar is based on the lunar cycle. And so that's why like Hanukkah ends up at a different time of year slightly. And uh, there's the, the, the whole the Chinese New Year uh, the Chinese uh, calendar, which I think is also the lunar uh, the lunar calendar. That's another one. There's yeah, they did different different places. We talked about this before, I think. They celebrate New Year's at a different time. I think we need to change the calendar. I've talked about this before probably. I think we need 13 months of four weeks and then one extra day. I think uh, somebody did a whole like TED talk about that. I think it would be an interesting idea. Pop. Suffix. C-Y. Uh, does it have a year? It does not have a year. Number one. It stands for, or it means action or practice. Man, this, this suffix gets used a lot. So action or practice, as in mendicancy. That is the example. Mendicancy. And I don't know what that is, so I can't help you to describe this any better other than it's the action or practice of mendicancy, mendicant something. I don't know. What is it? Number two, rank or office, as in chaplaincy. I know what a chaplain, I think that they're in the churches, aren't they? Maybe other things too. So it's the rank, they have a, they have a rank, they're, they work in an office, the chaplaincy. Two, body or class, as in madras, how do you say this word, madras, no, magistracy or magistracy, probably magistracy, the magistrates are people in England, I don't really know what their job is, but I've heard of that, the magistrate of the thing, uh, body or class, hmm, yeah, I don't know enough about that, we're gonna, in the M's, we're gonna learn about mendicancy and magistracy. It's a hard word because the C sound, the S or C sound comes up twice. Number four, state or quality, as in bankruptcy. When you don't have money or you say, I, the, the bankruptcy is a weird, it's a weird thing. You can technically have money, but say that, no, I don't really have any money. I don't know how it works. But something about that, something about money. No, I got no monies in the bank. You're in a state or quality of having no money. Um, this one, state or quality, has some more information. This is often replacing a final T or T-E at the end of the word. Um, I just, That really was weird. Spencer, you screwed. You made it confusing for the people. Let's start this over. This is often replacing a final T or T-E of the base word, as in accuracy. So the word accurate ends normally in a T-E. Also bankrupt ends in a T. But when you add the C-Y to talk about the state or the quality of that situation, you are replacing the T or the T-E to put in the C-Y. But not always. It says it's often replacing it. Not always, because bankrupt still has the T. I think it just depends on the way that the letters are pronounced, because you got in the you got to get in the C Y sound in there. You can't say accurate C. That's that's hard to say. So you say just say accuracy. But bankrupt, you can say bankrupt C. For some reason, it's easier to say. It depends on the context. You just say whatever you want to say. Pop. Next is cyan. Cyan or just cyan, cyan, cyan. Noun from circa 1889. A greenish blue color, and this is used in photography and color printing of one of the primary colors. So, um, yeah, when uh, you got a printer, and so different kinds of printers do different things. So one, uh, one type of printer 
has a lot of different colors. Typically, they are CMYK, which I believe stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. That's the K, is black. And uh, so it's the different combination of those colors to create the thing that you want to print or create. There is another, there's various ways that color can be created. Another one that sort of goes sort of hand in hand with CMYK is RGB, and that stands for red, green, blue. I don't really know why we have these different things. The computer will interpret the information differently if it's set to RGB or CMYK. Um, so you, you got to make sure that you're working in the right color space to get things printed in the right way. But cyan is one of the big ones. Maybe we'll post a picture of cyan, just the color. We do that sometimes. Soda. Here we have cyan again, but this is a prefix. So it's cyan or cyano, because sometimes they put the O in there. Number one, dark blue or just blue. Uh, which is funny because cyan, if we think of the color, it's the greenish blue. It's a much lighter blue. But here in this prefix contest, it's just dark blue or regular blue. As in the example, cyanobacterium. And uh, that's going to be the last word in this episode, actually. So we're going to learn about those. Those were very important to uh, to or just Earth. Earth in general was uh, was helped a lot by cyanobacterium. Number two, for the cyan or cyano prefix, it means cyanogen. Cyanogen. As in the example, cyanide. Is that how you spell cyanide? C-Y-A-N-I-D-E. Hmm. I guess when we get to cyanogen, we'll learn about that. To make this even more complicated, wow, (laughs) even more complicated than I thought. Number three, uh, it means cyanide, which is the example that we just read. But we have an example for this cyanide, which is, wait for it, cyanogenic, cyanogenetic, cyanogenetic. So c- the prefix cyan can mean cyanogen or cyanide. I'm not even going to, you. it's very confusing. The etymology really just says it's from the Greek. I would assume it's pronounced kyanos, because there's a K. Uh, And that means dark blue enamel. So yeah, that's that's why all this stuff is blue-related. I assume cyanogen and cyan, cyanide, cyanide, blue? I feel like cyanide is spelled differently. I could be wrong. Anyway, pop. Next is cyanamid. Cyanamid, C-Y-A-N-A-M-I-D-E, cyanamid, noun from 1838, 1, a caustic acidic compound, C-H-2-N-2. You get the C's and the H's and the N's, and you have a caustic acidic compound. Sounds bad. Sounds not like something you would want to touch or smell or look at. Or here, number two, the synonym is calcium cyanamid. Calcium cyanamid. That's all I got for that. Pop. Next is cyanate or cyanite. Noun from 1825. A salt as ammodium cyanate, cyanate, or ester of cyanic acid. So the example of the salt is that ammonium cyanate or cyanate or also an ester. So a salt or an ester of cyanic acid, which is our next word, pop, beedy pop, pop, cyanic acid, two words, noun from 1825, a strong acid used to prepare cyanates. I don't know what any of this stuff is. Um, the, we have these, uh, scientific, uh, the, the chemical letters for this strong acid. There's no numbers. So I think it's just a single, a single molecule, a single atom of each of these. H-O-C-N. I think it's hydrogen, oxygen, 
Ka, <laughs> I went through all the little C's. Um, uh, uh, carbon, I think, is the C, and then nitrogen. I think it's hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. It's a strong acid with those atoms, and it is used to prepare cyanates, which is a salt or an ester of cyanic acid. Just goes back and forth between those. Pop. Next is, yeah, cyanide or cyanid. Noun from 1826. One, a compound of cyanogen with a more electropositive element or group. As 1A, the synonym is potassium cyanide. And 1B, the synonym is sodium cyanide. I want to know why all of these have the prefix cyan or cyano. It's, I, I have a, it feels like there must be some, something blue in there, but I have no idea. Number two for cyanide is the number one definition for the word cyanogen, which will be in tomorrow's episode. Pop! Next is cyanine or cyanin. Noun from circa 1872. Any of various dyes used especially to sensitize photographic film to light from the green, yellow, red, and infrared regions of the spectrum. I never did the uh, the, fo- the 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 developing of photographs in a dark room. So, but I know that they have lots of different chemicals and liquids and stuff. So yeah, this wa- this must be one of them, cyanin. Boop. Next is cyano or cyano. Cyano, cyano. Adjective from 1929 relating to or containing the cyanogen group. What is the cyanogen group? I don't know. Again, we will learn about that tomorrow. Pop. Next is cyanoacrylate or cyanoacrylate. This is all one word. C-Y-A-N-O-A-C-R-Y-L-A-T-E. Noun from 1963. Any of several liquid acrylate monomers that readily polymerize as anions and are used as adhesives in industry and in closing wounds in surgery. A lot of words I didn't know. Something about the wounds in surgery. That part makes sense. Adhesive. Yeah, that makes sense. We have one more word for this episode. Pop, 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 pop. It is cyanobacterium. C Y A N O B A C T E R I U M. Noun from 1974. Any of a major group of photosynthetic bacteria that have two photosystems, produce molecular oxygen, and use water as an electron donating substrate in photosynthesis. Called also blue green alga uh the uh, the group name the major group name is just cyanobacteria with a capital c uh it's yeah it's bacteria it's this weird blend of i believe plant and animal if i'm understanding this correctly and also remembering correctly from my my old science days it's a bacteria that can i believe photosynthesize Right? Is that what it is? Use water as an electron donating substrate in photosynthesis. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'll have to post a link in the show notes, probably to Wikipedia or something, to learn more about cyanobacterium because uh, I believe they, they're they the ones who maybe put a lot of oxygen into the atmosphere or something, if I'm remembering that correctly. Maybe we can find a, a, a picture just of, of the cyanobacterium because... They seem like they, uh, they're they blue-green. Okay, those were all the words. We had cuvee, cuvette, cv, 
CV, CVA, CVS, CW, CW, CUM, CWO, CWT, CY, C, Cyan, Cyan or Cyano, Cyanamide, Cyana, Cyanate, Cyanic Acid, Cyanide, Cyanine, Cyano, no, that would be Cyano, Cyanoacrylate, and Cyanobacterium. Hmm, let's see. Yeah, none of these... I mean, I think I have to pick Cyanobacterium because of what they are. They did not come to existence in 1974. That's just when we we learned about them and created the word for them. But they were around... I believe billions of years ago. I'll have to I'll have to check my sources on that, but I'm pretty sure it's true. So yeah, cyanobacterium. You are a phos- <laughs> you are a photosynthetic bacteria with lots of things, and you do photosynthesis. Chikitikakataka. Yeah. All right, that is going to be a good place to end this episode. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yesterday's episode, which had a guest, Sarah McAnulty. You learned all about the cuttlefishes and stuff. Oh, just yesterday. See, I recorded her yesterday. Uh, I recorded her episode a long time ago. But just yesterday, I was just scrolling through Reddit and found a video of a cuttlefish doing its weird colory things where it was just doing, it was like waving colors through like light and dark to uh, hypnotize its prey. Man. Those those animals, there's something else. They literally look like aliens. What we would think an alien would look like if this was like some large water creature on an alien planet. I I I would I would if I were its prey, I would also be hypnotized by what it was doing. It's it like spread its its limbs out in all directions. It was amazing. I'll see if I can refine that video and I will uh uh post it i'll share it i'll do something with it that is going to be the end of this episode thank you so much for listening and until next time this is spencer dispensing information goodbye hello word nerds welcome to another episode of the dictionary this is uh the podcast where me spencer reads the book And then I talk about the things and I give you my personal thoughts and feelings and stories and connections and jokes and songs and things. Um, And there was... Oh, I also wanted to mention if you are not aware, I don't know how often it's happened recently, but, you know, to be transparent, I will say that uh, I I am left-leaning in my politics. I am also not a particularly religious person. I'm a spiritual person, but not religious. Uh, not that I have anything against those per se, but I am not that. So, you know, I'm kind of like middle of the road. You know, I'm just saying this so you, uh, if you didn't already know this, um, you get a bit of an idea of, you know, what the, this content is all about and what I'm going to maybe say about this content. Uh, you know, that being said, there's nothing except maybe sort of maybe one thing in here, but not really anything in this episode. Uh, It was just literally a thought that I had this morning, and I'm recording it, so I wanted to say it so I don't forget. Although, we are going to... Yeah, there is there is another word. Yeah. Um, And uh, what else? What else? Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. I don't know. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. All right, let's just talk about the words. The first word is cyano cyanocobalamin cyanocobalamin c y a n o c o b a l a m i n uh you could also put an e at the end cyanocobalamin noun from 1950 it's a very long word they spell it twice because of the e at the end so it takes up a ton of space But then the definition is very short. All it is, is the number one definition for vitamin B12. That's it. Cyanocobalamin. And uh, let's see. This is from cyan plus cobalt. Cobalt. I think cobalt is also blue. And then also vitamin. So 
blue blue vitamin does b stand for blue in vitamin b i don't think so hmm interesting um so my sound effect will be uh something that will not make sense right away but it will maybe make sense later in this episode sort of maybe well maybe just to some people it is is going to be i know it's a bad sound but it's just it's just something the next word is cyanogen we talked a lot about this in the last episode so if you didn't hear that go back i didn't i didn't tell you anything i didn't explain to you what it is cuz i didn't know what it is i still don't i'm going to learn about it now just like you cyanogen noun from 1816 1 a monovalent group and then it shows a hyphen and a cn capitalized so that might be carbon and nitrogen but i don't know what the dash is before that but anyway it's a monovalent group present in cyanides and that's why cyanogen and cyanide were talked about together yesterday number two a colorless flammable poisonous gas and the uh the 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 scientific letters and numbers is cn again but this time it's in parentheses and then there's a subscript two so there's it's cn twice i don't know why it can't be c2n2 for some reason there's a there's a there's a chemical reason a chemistry reason why it's done this way not sure what it is i don't know <sighs> next is cyanogenetic or cyanogenetic uh let's see you can oh it could be cyo cyanogenetic or cyanogenic you can take out the the et there phone home adjective from 1902 capable of producing cyanide and the example of that is as hydrogen cyanide capable of producing cyanide like in hydrogen cyanide we have an example of how to use this word a cyanogenetic glucoside glucoside a cyanogenetic glucoside i didn't know where to put the emphasis on any of those words cyanogenesis nope that's not how you say that word cyanogenesis that is a noun so that would maybe be the the production the beginning of the production of cyanide <laughs> next is cyanohydrin or maybe just cyanohydrin. Uh, that part is spelled H Y D R I N. Noun from 1925. Any of various compounds containing both cyano or cyano and hydroxyl groups. Cyano groups and hydroxyl groups. It's got them both. Don't know what any of it is. <laughs> Next is cyanosis, cyanosis, noun from 1834, a bluish or purplish discoloration as of skin due to deficient oxygenation of the blood. So if your blood is not getting enough oxygen in it, it could be for a variety of reasons, your skin might turn bluish or purplish and then you would have this condition called cyanosis because cyan cyano it means kind of kind of blue cyanotic is an adjective if you have cyanosis you would be cyanotic and this is from the greek kyanosis maybe which means dark blue color and that is that <sighs> Next is cyanuric acid. Cyanuric acid. So we have cyan, we have uric, and acid. So this is two words. Noun from 1834. 
a crystalline weak acid that yields cyanic acid when heated. It's a very weak acid, but then when you cook it, it yields or it creates cyanic acid. And the chemical chemical letters and numbers, I don't remember the name of that thing. It is. We have C3N3, in parentheses is OH, and then a 3 for the OH. Um, yeah, the, the etymology is just saying that we're combining cyan plus urea, or urea. That is, uh, I think that has to do with, I think ur- urea is in your urine, so it's something about that, maybe. <sighs> we're changing courses here. This word is pronounced Sibylle. It is spelled capital C-Y-B-E-L-E, Sibylle. Noun from 1576. A nature goddess of the ancient peoples of Asia Minor. And uh, we will have to post a picture because she probably has got, I don't know, maybe leaves and branches and animals, something. Just nature. Just, I like the idea of a nature goddess that's it yeah i'm sure i'm sure that there has been lots of art created for sibylle (sighs) all right now we are starting a new section with the word cyber and we're going to have a number of cyber words all the way into next the next episode Um, and that is why i have chosen to do this very weird sound effect because when we first got the internet when i was a kid we had dial up I'm sure there are some people who still technically have dial-up, but it's pretty rare. But yeah, dial-up is when you would literally use the phone, your phone connection, your landline phone, if you even, if you had, I mean, people had them. You don't, many people don't even have them today, because you don't need it. But we used the phone connection to connect to the internet with a very slow modem, if you were if you had the 56k modem you you were speeding along you were fancy but a lot of us didn't have that at least not right away and you would have to you'd connect to the phone and it would make the dial sounds and then it would make this sound and uh, maybe I should put a, an audio clip of this whole thing in full. We had to wait a while. Maybe I should put the whole thing in there so kids today can hear what we had to go through if we wanted to connect to the internet. You don't know how lucky you are. All right. So this this uh, this word cyber, it's an adjective from 1991. Yeah, that would have been about the time when we were getting the internet. Most of us. I was 11. This is of relating to or involving computers or computer networks, as of the internet, as in the cyber marketplace. A place to go to buy things on the internet. Uh, And it says it's just from the word cyber, which is a prefix, which is actually our next word. So did the prefix come before the actual word? That seems odd. (sighs) Next is this cyber prefix. It means computer or computer network. As in, hoo-hoo, cyberspace. Cyberspace will be in tomorrow's episode. Ooh, I'm traveling through cyberspace. Sorry. Next. It is, it's not a good word. It is cyberbullying. Noun from 2000. The electronic posting of mean-spirited messages about a person as a student 
often done anonymously. Yeah, typically this is done by students against other students, all in the internet world, online. Um, I will lastly just say cyberbullying, or cyberbully is a noun or a verb. Um, but yeah, this has resulted literally in deaths, if you did not know this. I'm sorry to get uh, to get sad here, but this is a fact, and we have to talk about it. We're just not going to pass right by cyberbullying. There's regular bullying where people are, uh, where uh, kids, it's not necessarily, it's not always kids, but it's often kids, are saying mean things to other kids, or in worst cases, physically attacking other kids. And then when the internet came around, and there were things like, instant messaging and social media eventually then it became cyberbullying and the physical real world bullying is still happening which is terrible adults do this as well but because because people can uh be sort of anonymous either literally or not um because they're not face to face they feel like they're more anonymous and uh it makes people feel, you know, trolls, internet trolls. It makes people feel like they can just say whatever they want to say. Uh, I'm sure that if I haven't already, I will eventually get some cyber bullying because of this podcast and things I say. I don't care. Whatever. You know what? This is going to happen eventually anyway. Fuck you. Fuck you, trolls. Just, and cyber bullying. Just, this is ridiculous why this is happening. Um... People feel like because they are behind the wall of the internet in their own little room that they can just say whatever they want. And there are people who have literally committed suicide because of it. And it does not make me happy. Can you tell? All right. Let's move on now to something completely different, but still in the cyber world. I have actually used used this thing. It is... There's the sound effect. It is... Cyber Cafe. Cyber Cafe. Noun from 1994. I, I, I just want to know what is going through the kids who are listening, the kids' heads hearing, what is a cyber cafe? <laughs> and then we'll get to some other ones, I'm sure, that they will be confused about. A cyber cafe is a cafe or coffee shop providing computers for access to the internet. Because... Not a lot of people had the internet. Somebody had the bright idea to go to a physical location, a cafe, where you can get maybe a, a cappuccino and maybe a Danish, and you could hop on the internet. You can go cyber surfing in cyberspace. Um, I do remember going to one not maybe necessarily a cafe just a place to get on the internet cuz i was i was uh i was traveling and i didn't ha- i was yeah i didn't i didn't have a like a home base so i needed to check my email and stuff anyway yeah cyber cafe they might still exist in some places <laughs> next is cyber citizen cyber citizen one word noun from also 1994 and the synonym for cyber citizen is netizen, N-E-T-I-Z-E-N. So they, what they did there was they took net from internet and combined it with citizen, and they are a netizen. So I would think that pretty much every person who accesses the internet in some way is a netizen, and then maybe also people who are playing those games that just are that they live in the internet world might also be netizens how do you say that word though netizen or netizen netizen i don't know i don't care nah (sighs) cyber nation is next noun from 1962 the Automatic control of a process or operation, as in manufacturing, by means of computers. And cybernated is an adjective. So, it's not a nation. 
that's a, it's a little confusing. It's really, the first part is cyber n cybern plus Asian, because we're getting that part cybern from the word cybernetics, which we will get to in this episode. So it's cybern from cybernetics plus Asian. It's not a nation. It is not a country of computers. That doesn't make any sense. It's just the uh, the use of computers in manufacturing. That's pretty much what it is. <laughs> Next is Cybernaut. It's uh, not N-A-U-T, like astronaut, cosmonaut. And uh, this is a noun from 18... No, <laughs> not the 1800s. <laughs> Sorry. 1989... 1989. And again, we have the synonym netizen. Somebody who is on the internet is a cybernaut. They are exploring the cyberspace. (sighs) Next is cybernetician. Cybernetician. Noun from, this is an old one, 1951. A specialist in cybernetics. And yeah, again, we're going to get to that one soon. Somebody who's expert in cybernetics is a cybernetician. Relatedly, we have cyberneticist. Noun from 1948, three years before cybernetician. And the synonym is just cybernetician. It's the same thing. They just started using the word cyberneticist first and then they went to cybernetician, and then, I guess eventually, maybe we went to cybernaut, and cyber citizen, and netizen. So what is cybernetics? <sighs> Man, that's killing my throat. It's, that's our next word, cybernetics. Noun from 1948. It is the science of communication and control theory that is concerned especially with the comparative study of automatic control systems. And that is the end of the sentence. And there's a very long parenthesis. So examples of these automatic control systems would be the nervous system and brain and mechanical electrical communication systems. So... Science of communication and control theory that's concerned especially with system with a comparable study. Hmm. Is this are they talking about combining your your biological nervous system and your brain with computers? Essentially, is that what they're saying? We obviously have to post a link to more information about cybernetics in the show notes if you want to learn more. So this is from the Greek word. Cybernetes, or Kybernetes, which means pilot or governor. And, oh, that is from Kybernon, which means to steer or govern. And then some other stuff, like an E and a suffix. Um, hmm. Well, based on this information, it looks like just the word cyber might be from this Greek word or a related Greek word. It did not it did not give us that before. Huh. Interesting. The 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 cyber prefix did come from cybernetic though. Um which of course came from kybernetes, the Greek word. So yeah, it seems like it all comes from that. Which is huh. So all of the cyber words that we have come from this idea of cybernetics. We just took the first part of it because it had to do with, I guess, computery kind of things. And I'm just talking this out loud to see if I can just gather why we use this word pretty much. Um, But this word, cybernetics, came from an old Greek word, which is really just steering, governing, controlling. Um, Yeah. So the word cyber really means has nothing to do with computers. Not really. Not in the the etymological sense. Hmm. It's blowing my mind, man. Uh, cybernetic 
or cybernetical, that is an adjective, and cybernetically is an adverb. Hmm, this is fascinating. <sighs> we are changing things up. We're still in the cyber world. This one is cyber porn. Yeah, porn, P O R N. Noun from 1992. It is pornography accessible online, especially via the internet. I don't know why it says especially, though. Isn't it exclusively via the internet? You can't access things online without the internet. It's the same thing. Anyway, uh, yeah, nobody calls this cyber porn anymore. They did back in the day, but it's just, th these days, that's just all where it is. It's just porn is porn is porn is cyber porn is porn. Uh, yeah, that's that. The, many, many older people uh, have many stories of, oh, we had to wait minutes or hours just to download one picture. You'll hear comedians say stuff like that. The world has changed. Last word. It is cyberpunk. That's so cool. Cyberpunk. Noun from 1983. So this was before the internet really became a thing, be, be, before it got its hold on everybody. Number one, science fiction dealing with future urban societies dominated by computer technology. And uh, I, think, I think we have to post maybe some examples, maybe either on social media or in the show notes. Maybe we need to find some examples of this type of science fiction I think it sounds it sounds kind of fun. Number two for cyberpunk, an opportunistic computer hacker. Just looking for any opportunity to hack a computer. All right, so we had some words today. I shall read them to you. They were cyanocobalamin, cy cyanogen, cyanogenetic. Cyanohydrin, hail cyanohydrin, cyanosis, cyanuric acid, Sibley, cyber, cyber, cyber bullying, cyber cafe, cyber citizen, I don't know why these sound so weird now, cybernation, cybernaut, cybernetician, cyberneticist, cybernetics, cyber porn, and cyberpunk. Well, I obviously had some very strong feelings about cyberbullying. Not sure if I want to pick that for the word of the episode. Um, let's see. There, there's some fun words in here. Uh, ooh, let's see. I don't know if I'm going to pick any of these more like chemical scientific words. Um, oh, maybe we'll pick Sibley as the word of the episode because it's com it's the opposite of a lot of these. This whole cyber world. I think we are all way too ingrained in that. I think there it has some some pros and cons. Technology and the internet definitely has pros and cons. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm all about getting back to nature and you know living out in nature, being cool with that. But also, you know, we I like the internet. I like being able to do this and put this out on the internet and and interact with people over the internet. There's a lot of cool people out there. They're not all cyber bullies. In fact, most of them are not. Most of the people are cool. You're cool. And uh, yeah, just want to be, be more with nature in my life. I like that. Sibley. Sibley. I've, ha I've heard this. I don't remember where, but I think I've heard this. Sibley is the nature goddess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is going to be the end of this silly episode. It's not that silly. It's no no more silly than Sibley or other things. Thank you very much for listening. I do appreciate it. Go, go tell some other people about it. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. How are you doing today? Welcome to the dictionary. This is my podcast and my name is Spencer. How are you? I'm great. So, 
what are, what are we going to say in this episode? We will find out. We will both find out together. The first word in this episode is cybersecurity. All one word. We're still in the cyber section. That'll be about half of this episode. Maybe a little less, actually. Cybersecurity. Noun from 1994. Measures taken to protect a computer or computer system against unauthorized access or attack. And the example of the, uh, the computer system might be the internet. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how people are hacking computers through the internet. And uh, cyber, cybersecurity is things that you can put in place on the computer, on the internet, on the things and the stuff to make it harder for people to, uh, to hack, to attack your computer, your system, then they, and they do it unauthorized. They are not authorized to be getting into your computer systems. Oh, uh, my sound effect shall be... Next is cybersex. It's in the book. Uh, this is one word, noun from 1991. Um... Yesterday, yesterday's episode had cyber porn, which is from 1992. What is why are why were they different years? I wonder. That's interesting. So, cyber sex number one, online sex oriented conversations and exchanges. You know, it's talking to people over the internet in a cyber way, talking about sexual stuff. It has the word exchanges. I think that should be, in this context, sex changes, but not sex change, just like sex changes. You know, you're exchanging, you're talking about, you get it. Okay, moving on. Number two, sex-oriented material available on a computer. And an example would be cyber porn, even though nobody uses that word. <laughs> Next word is cyberspace. One word Noun from 1982. The online world of computer networks and especially the internet. The whole cyberspace world. I love those movies from, you know, around this time, the 80s, the 90s, when the internet was new and interesting and, you know, kind of this unique novel thing, like The Lawnmower Man. And uh, yeah, it's just fun to go back and look at those movies and see how how kind of silly our, the por portrayal of cyberspace was. If you haven't seen The Lawnmower Man, you got you got to go see it. You got to see it. It's available, I'm sure. Cyberspace. I don't know. I don't think I have anything else to say about that. It's the space for the cyber stuff. We learned about cyber yesterday. <laughs> Next is Cyber Surfer. <laughs> One word. Noun from 1993. One who surfs the internet. I guess it's great that they have all these cyber words because they are still sort of in use, but they, 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 they really don't get used. I mean, it's just like these really old ones from like the 1500s. We, we don't use them anymore, typically, but, uh, but they're still words that exist, and maybe it's good to learn them for some reason. You got to learn your history, and your history is things like cyberspace and cyberpunk and cybernaut and cyber cafe. All right, uh, we got to move on to the next one. This is the last of the cyber words. That, that was, uh, well, I guess we'll get there in a second. So this word is cyber terrorism. Cyber terrorism. Maybe a cyber terrorist is hacking your cybersecurity. And uh, maybe they're going to cyber bully you. Cyber terrorism is a noun from 1994. Terrorist uh, activities intended to damage or disrupt vital computer systems. People, people want to mess up your computer systems for some reason. Usually this is going to be more of a political thing or a, uh, you know, other countries what was that? That show Twenty Four. Uh, there was a, that was all about um, stopping terrorists, and there was a lot of there was some, not a lot, but I guess I think there was some cyber terrorism going on there as well. I think I remember one season where that was part of it. Yeah, 
terrorism through this and and now i mean these days that's like feels like that's practically all it is it's all in the computer uh the internet changing things sending information to make people think one thing or another and it's all forms of terrorism next is cyborg c y b o r g noun from 1960 1960 and it is a bionic human bionic should we should we see if we can go back and uh find the actual definition of that i assume assume it would be in here let's see i think i'm pretty close b i o b i o let's flip to this page where is you bionic we're oh so close here we go is it a problem that i just do not have any memory of this uh bionic of or related to bionics having normal biological capability or performance enhanced by or as if by electronic or electromechanical devices so it's something biological with electronical stuff making it better that's what a cyborg is so many different mm, portrayals of cyborgs in in media and content uh maybe i'll find some fun pictures of some of them over the years uh but it uh, it came into being in 1960 what was the first one i wonder um i know there was that show uh danger will robinson uh i can't remember the name lost in space was the name of the show and then they they uh, rebooted it recently on netflix i think uh would he would that robot be considered a cyborg i'm not sure also it says a bionic human i don't think it has to be a human but i think it's uh i mean there's also android and that's a whole other thing hmm but but the reason it's uh it's this like living thing along with electronics is because it is combining uh cyb cyb from cybernetic which we learned about yesterday and then also org org from organism so it's an organism with computery stuff as well cyb org and then in star trek there was the borg b-o-r-g so I have a feeling they just took cyborg and they shortened it down because those, the Borg is all uh, people who were living creatures that got turned into uh, half living, half electronical, half, you know, cyborgs. Borg. The Borg. Man, they, they really, they mess things up, that Borg. <laughs> Next is Cybrarian. It's like librarian, but with a C-Y. Noun from 1992, and it is a person whose job is to find, collect, and manage information that is available on the World Wide Web. And this is literally a blend of cyber plus librarian. I don't believe this job exists anymore. Your job is to find information on the internet, collect it, and manage it isn't that what isn't that the job of the internet is to do all that or like people who program certain websites how can one how can people go do that how do you it just doesn't even make sense to me if you are a cy cybrarian <laughs> i didn't even know this word existed uh or if you were or if you know somebody who was i, I want to talk to you that's this is a this is great <laughs> This, this was my sound effect to, to be sort of close to the word cyborg. The Transformers, they're not cyborgs, really, I don't think. But uh, has anybody delved into the, the history of the Transformers? Did they once, were they once biological living things and then they just got electronics and computer parts added to them gradually? Huh, I wonder. I never followed it, really. Okay, uh, next is... I think I already did the sound effect, so I'm not going to do it again. Sorry, just have to deal with it. It is psyched. I think that's how you would say it, although I would want to say psychad, but I think it's just psyched. C-Y-C-A-D. Noun from 1845. Any of an order, psychadales, of dioecious psychadophytes. 
that flourished especially during the Jurassic and are represented by four surviving families of palm-like tropical plants. So these are plants. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So, okay, yeah, the order name is Cycadel, Cycadels, Cycadeles, one of those. And they are Dioecious, Dioecious, D-I-O-E-C-I-O-U-S. So many vowels. I don't know what Dioecious means. Uh, Dioecious Cycadophytes. And uh, let's see, the, let's see, so the genus name is from the Greek Cycas, or Kaikas, with Ks, uh, which is a variation of Koikas, which is from Koix, it's the plural of Koix, and I don't think that's how you pronounce that word, it's just a kind of palm, like a palm tree, a palm plant, so yeah, I wonder if, um, there was a cut scene from the first Jurassic Park movie, where, uh, Laura Dern, Laura Dern? Yeah. Uh, she, because she's a, a botanist, she was an expert on the plants from, you know, millions of years ago. And I I remember seeing it that she was like, this this plant isn't supposed to be here. It's extinct. Why is it here? So I wonder if that might have been a, a, a psychid plant. <laughs> Next is Cycadioid. Cycadioid. C Y C A D. E-O-I-D. Noun from 1860. Any of a division of extinct Jurassic to Cretaceous gymnosperms that differ from the cycadophytes chiefly in having the reproductive organs on the trunk embedded in a thick covering of bracts and scales. So it sounds like they are similar to the thing that we just read, the cycad, cycads, but uh, but their reproductive organs are different on the trunk. Hmm. The division name is Cycadioidophyta, and then it says S Y N. Man, I really need to remind myself about what that means. Maybe maybe let's just go take a quick a quick look. No, I don't want to go to the pronunciation symbols. I want to go to the Abbreviation page, S-Y-N, is it here? Synonym, okay, synonym? Uh, so it was the Cycadioidophyta, and then synonym Benetitophyta, Benetitophyta. I think that is it. So that's the division for the Cycadioids. The etymology is, uh, you know, Looks similar to Psyched. <laughs> Next is Psychadophyte. It's a P H Y T E. So, Psychadophyte has already been mentioned twice in the last two words. Uh, so, let's learn about it. It is a noun from 1911. Any of a division, Psychadophyta, of usually unbranched. Mostly extinct gymnosperms with pinnate leaves, large pith, little xylem, and a thick cortex that includes the cycads, cycadioids, and seed ferns. So I guess the cycads and the cycadioids are all part of the cycadophytes. And if we look back at the definition, yes, cycad, it said that they are dioecious cycadophytes and for cycadioid i'm sure all of your brains have completely shut down it's like you're just saying the same words over and over again yes i understand your pain um and i'm the one i'm lucky because i have this book in front of me and you just have to listen to this so and then so cycadioid they are uh they oh they differ from cycadophytes so maybe they're not but this the cycadophyte definition said that it includes the cycadioids I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. But I like it. It has a large pith and little xylem. Xylem is X-Y-L-E-M. Okay. Oh, and then uh, let's see. The etymology says it's from Cycas plus the Greek phyton. That's the uh, the suffix here is phyte. Uh, so that means plant. But they're already a plant. So I wonder why... It's like plant plant, 
It's a cycad plant. Cycads are already a plant. Hmm, interesting. Let's talk about something else. We have Cycasin. Cycasin. C Y C A S I N. Noun from circa 1965. A glucoside, C8H16. N2O7 that occurs in cycads and results in toxic and carcinogenic effects when introduced into mammals. So it sounds like these cycads are uh, they're kind of poisonous. Poisonous to uh, to mammals. Hmm. Cycosin. I wonder what what it, what does it do to mammals? Don't eat cycads or just cycads. Next is the prefix cycle or cyclo. Uh, it uh, it means number one, circle, circle, as in the example cyclometer. So what is that meter gonna do? Well, we we will we will learn about that uh, later, later, later. Um, trying to figure out where it is. Cy- uh, it's cyclometer. That's how you pronounce it. Not cyclometer. Cyclometer. That is going to be uh, two days from now. We'll learn about it later. But it's something to do with a circle. And then number two for the cyclo prefix, it means cyclic. So that's like a like a like a spiral, right? Cyclic, cyclical. I think so. Uh, and the example here is cyclohexane which will also be in the same episode two days from now, same episode with cyclometer. And uh, I think that is good for that. Next is cyclamate, or just cyclamate. Noun from 1954, an artificially prepared salt of sodium or calcium used especially formerly as a sweetener. So I guess that means that they just don't use it anymore. Back in the 50s, maybe the 60s, they used this cyclamate as a sweetener. I'm a guessing, I'm a guessing. Uh, Maybe I will uh, post some more information in the show notes so you can go learn more about it. But, But yeah, I have a feeling it's not a very good, healthy thing for your body, which is probably why it's not used anymore. Like, uh, what's the other one? Aspartame. That still gets used, but it shouldn't. That stuff's bad for you. Next is cyclamin. Cyclamin. Or just cyclamin. C-Y-C-L-A-M-E-N. Noun from circa uh, 1550. Any of a genus... Cyclamen, of old world plants of the primrose family, having showy nodding flowers. I, I wonder what the word nodding here means. Uh, like like you're nodding your head. Uh, do, do they move? Do they nod their heads? Probably not. Do they, uh, do maybe the flowers like angle out in a weird way? I don't know. We'll learn about that when we get to the ends. Um, let's see. We we have all these, uh, well, I guess like cyclamate, cyclamin, and all these other ones that are coming up, these are all probably all part of the, uh, the, this cycle or cyclo prefix that we just had, which means either circle or cyclic. So let's see, I'm trying to see, maybe these cyclamin flowers are cyclical in some way or have a circle somewhere. Hmm. The, uh, that's what I would guess, but I'm just not sure. Next, we got another one. It is cyclase or cyclase. Noun from 1946. An enzyme that catalyzes cyclization or cyclization of a compound. An enzyme that catalyzes cyclization of a compound. So there's a compound, and it needs to go through this process of cyclization, and uh, but it needs it needs something to get that going. That's what catalyzes it. It's a catalyst, is a thing that gets a thing going. 
That's just an easy way to describe it. So this, this enzyme, this cyclase, is that enzyme that gets that process going in a compound. Uh, by the way, the example of this enzyme, there are, I guess, different ones. Uh, one of them would be adenylate cyclase, just to be more specific. Last word, cyclozacine, cyclozacine or cyclozacen. I like cyclozacine. C y c l a z o c i n e. Noun from uh, ma, 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 1966. An analgesic drug, C18, H25, NO, that inhibits the effect of morphine and related addictive drugs and is used in the treatment of drug addiction. And uh, looking at the etymology, it's just a bunch of scientific y stuff, so I'm not going to describe it. But uh, yeah. I guess if you're, uh, let's see, it inhibits the effects. So if you if you're on some uh, if you're addicted to drugs, maybe you need some cyclozacine to help you get off of it. But it's from 1966, so I don't know if this is something that is still used. But obviously, don't. Uh, well, first of all, try not to get addicted to drugs. Second of all, don't go just grabbing random stuff. You got to talk to your doctor first. All right. So the words in this episode were cybersecurity. Cyber sex, cyber space, cyber speak, cyber surfer, cyber terrorism, cyborg, cybrarian, cycad, cycadioid, cycadophyte, cycosin, cyclo, cyclamate, cyclamin, cyclase, and cyclozacine. Well, what did I pick yesterday? I think I picked uh, Cyber Boo. No, I picked Sibylle. Um, so maybe I think I'm going to pick Cybrarian as the word of the episode because, man, that's just it's just a great word and a great job that I don't think exists. I mean, what what do you do? What does a Cybrarian do? What does a Cybrarian do? I don't know. That's it. That's my song. All right. That was fun. Uh, let's see what, uh, a couple of movies I've watched. Uh, I went and saw Dr. Strange 2 cause that just came out recently and I didn't even know it was directed by Sam Raimi until the movie was over. But then I was like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think I need to see it again, uh, to sort of process everything. There was a lot going on. Uh, you know, all those movies are pretty long. So there's, they pack in a lot of stuff. And uh, obviously, you gotta you gotta watch all the older things, so you know what's going on. And um, you know, if I'm if I'm comparing recent multiverse movies, um, I think I liked Everything Everywhere All at Once more, just because it's just a very different movie, and you know, I just enjoyed it more as a film. But if you're looking for some some fun, crazy stuff that's very comic booky. Um, that's, you know, it, there's, there's a, there's a level of realism that's a little bit weird in comic book movies and has been getting crazier and crazier. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, also we just watched uh, a movie from, I don't know, 13 years ago that I didn't know about called Triangle. And, uh, it's, it's kind of horror thrillery. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I was having some trouble with it. But then as it went on, I started to like it better and better. Uh, so overall, I enjoyed it. There was some weird stuff, but, you know, I understood why they had to make some decisions that they had to make. Uh, but yeah, overall, it was a fun, a fun movie. Um, okay, I think that's where I'm going to stop this episode. Thank you very much for listening to me talk. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. How is you doing? What is going on with you? You can... You can tell me if you want to. There are ways. I won't be able to hear it for a while, though. Probably. Uh, alright. So, the first word in this episode is... Cycle. C-Y-C-L-E. First form. 
noun from the 14th century. We got a bunch of definitions here. One, an interval of time during which a sequence of a recurring succession of events or phenomena is completed, as in a four-year cycle of growth and development. Every four years, something, the growth and the development happens, and then again, 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 and again. Yeah, there's a lot of cycles in life. Um, hmm. All right, maybe we'll come back to that. 2A, a course or series of events or operations that recur regularly and usually lead back to the starting point. What what might that be? Uh, I mean, you know, like a like a, a track maybe literally like a for cars or running. Uh, regularly to lead back to the starting point. That's what a cycle is. To be. Uh, I'm also thinking like maybe the dishwasher cycle could be considered for this 2A. The, a course or series of events. Yes, the washing of the dishes. Uh, it recurs regularly and then it leads back to the big, the starting point. Mm, not in the sense that the dishes are dirty again. They're clean. But yeah, maybe that's not the best example. To be one complete performance of a vibration, electric oscillation, current alternation, or other periodic process. And uh, yeah, lots of things like that. Well, so we're talking about electricity here. Uh, there's there's the AC alternating current and DC direct current. So alternating current. Uh, yeah, it's it's all cycles. Anything that's energy is probably in some sort of cycle. I think, you know, musical notes, vibration, sound, um, one hertz, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's hertz, it's vibrations, that's a cycle, when it vibrates, it's, you know, from one up to one down, oh, this is a terrible description, it's very bad, it's all, it's all cycles, life is cycles. 2C, a permutation of a set of ordered elements in which each element takes the place of the next and the last becomes first. What might this be? There's no example. Primitive set of ordered elements. So uh, so the first one is done and then the one behind it takes its place. And then the one behind that takes its place. And yeah, hmm. Not sure what that would be. I don't know a good example, but that's what it is. 2D. A takeoff and landing of an airplane is called a cycle? Why do they call that a cycle? I guess, oh, I guess the whole process of taking off and landing is a cycle because you started it on the ground, you went up in the air, and then you ended up uh, back on the ground. That's a cycle. Three, a circular or spiral arrangement as 3A an imaginary circle or orbit in the heavens. So I guess we're talking about anything that's going around like a planet or a, a satellite. It's going to go around in a cycle. 3B is the number 10 definition for the word ring. Because a ring is a circle, is a cycle. Yeah. Number 4, a long period of time. And the synonym is age. Oh, it's it's been a long age since I... I don't know. Yeah, cycle. It's a whole period of time. Sorry, not a, I don't know, always got something to say. 5A. A group of creative works treating the same theme. And examples of these creative works would be poems, plays, or songs. You call that a cycle. I have not heard this. A group of creative works treating the same theme. They all are talking about the same idea, just in different ways, different forms of art. Hmm. It's a cycle. 5B. A series of narratives dealing typically with the exploits of a legendary hero. Again, I'm not very literary savvy, so I'm not sure what this is. 6A is bicycle, that's the synonym, bicycle, 
There's two, two wheels. 6B is tricycle, tricycle, three wheels. 6C is motorcycle, a cycle with a motor. And then I'm going to throw in my own 6D. It's not here in the book. I'm going to also add unicycle, one wheel unicycle. Seven, this series of a single, double, triple, and home run hit in any order by one player during one baseball game. So if a, if a player, if I'm reading this right, a player gets in one game a single, a double, a triple, and a home run in any order, then they've hit the cycle. Is that right? I guess it must be right. Uh, okay, my sound effect will be Second form of cycle. This is the verb from 1842, starting with intransitive. 1A, to pass through a cycle. How do you do that? What kind of cycle are we talking about? 1B, to recur in cycles. 2, to ride a cycle. Specifically, the synonym bicycle. To ride a bicycle. You're going to go cycling. Transitive, there's just one. To cause to go through a cycle. And again, I don't know what kind of cycle we're talking about here. Um, maybe the airplane cycle. Maybe the thing. I don't know. Lots of for, lots of options. Cycler is a noun. The one, probably, who is on a bicycle. Cycleway is next. Noun from 1899. It is British. And the synonym is bikeway. So we here in America might say bikeway, although I don't even know how often that gets used. But then in uh, jolly old England, they might say cycleway. Next is, you could pronounce it two ways, cyclic or cyclic. Cyclic, cyclic. Or also cyclical or cyclical. This is an adjective from 1794, 1A, of relating to or being a cycle. 1B, moving in cycles, as in cyclical time or cyclic time. Ooh, yeah, yeah, we're getting heady there. Cycles, so it's, uh, you know, like a circle. A circle is a cycle. It's cyclical. Cyclical? Time is a circle. Everything is a circle. 1C, of relating to or, I lost my place, or being a chemical compound containing a ring of atoms. Because it's a ring. It's a circle. It's a cycle. Cyclic. Number two says it is cyclic. So I guess you cannot use cyclical in this context. So number two is being a mathematical group that has an element such that every element of the group can be expressed as one of its powers. Something about the powers. Cyclically, cyclically um, is an adverb, and you can cyclically, I'm trying to, there's two versions of it. Cyclically, you can spell it two ways, basically. There's the version with an A-L, and then there's the version without the A-L. Uh, oh, I'm just checking this. Did I miss any etymology? Oh, I sure did. I surely did. The first word, cycle, uh, it is from Middle English. Sickle or cycle from uh, Lower Latin, cyclus from Greek. How do you say, how do you say Greek? Sick. Cyclos or kyklos, which means circle or wheel or cycle. And there's more at the word wheel. All right, back to where we were. Cyclic AMP. Two words, AMP is all caps. Uh, I assume you spell the letters out like that. I don't think you, yeah, I don't think you uh, call it AMP. Cyclic AMP, maybe AMP. 
noun from 1966, a cyclic mononucleotide of adenosine that is formed from ATP and is responsible for the intracellular mediation of hormonal effects on various cellular processes, called also adenosine 3,5-monophosphate. So that's, we can see where we get the AMP, that is the A in adenosine, and then the MP from monophosphate. And I don't know what the three and the five are. It's three apostrophe comma five apostrophe. I do, don't know what that means. Next is cyclic, cyclic or cyclic GMP. GMP, yeah. Noun from 1969. A cyclic mononucleotide of guanosine that acts similarly to cyclic AMP as a secondary messenger in response to hormones. Lots of stuff going on in the body. And the GMP stands for guanosine or guanosine. That's the G. The M is mon, M-O-N. That's the single, like the mononucleotide, one. And then the P is phosphate. Yeah, just like we had in the other one, monophosphate. Same thing, but instead of adenosine, it's guanosine. Do 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 do. Next is cyclicity. Cyclicity or cyclicity. Noun from 1944. The quality or state of being cyclic, as in estrus cyclicity. And it is called also cyclicality. Cyclicality. Maybe that was the old form. But now it's just cyclicity. But yeah, anything that's like in a cycle that's cyclical it has cyclicity. I'm trying to think if I can think of an example. I mean, typically when I think of cyclical, I think of something like a spiral. But it's not necessarily. It's really just something in a circle goes back to where it started, and it just does that over and over again. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the motion with my hand in a circle, sort of. My hand, my finger, has cyclicity because it is doing the same cycle over and over again. Next is cyclin or cyclin. Noun from 1983... Any of a group of proteins active in controlling the cell cycle and in initiating DNA synthesis. Group of proteins that control the cycles of the cells, and also when the cells need to create DNA, these proteins, these cyclin or cyclin proteins, help to create. Help tell the, D the cell to create DNA. I think that's what it's saying. That's why they're called cyclin, because it's all about the cycle. Do -do 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 -do. Next is cyclist. Noun from 1882. One who rides a cycle. And now I'm going to find a picture of uh, someone in the, uh, the late 1800s Riding a cycle, a, some sort of cycle. It could be one of those penny farthings with a real big front wheel and the real little back wheel. And why those things got created in the first place, I don't know. Who, why, why, what, what, what reason was it? You know, that's got to be in here. Penny farthing, I bet you that's in this book somewhere. I hope there's a picture. But why would somebody think to make a bike with a very big wheel and a very small wheel? I don't understand the physics of that. It seems like a very silly idea to me. Um, I'm just I'm just flipping through the pages to see if to see if it's in here because now I am very curious. And I think it's called penny farthing, isn't it? Here we go. I'm in the right place. Uh, let's see, penny, 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 penny. I could be wrong on the name because I'm not seeing it. Hmm, interesting. All right, we'll we'll figure it out later. 
So, that was somebody who rides a cycle is a cyclist. Next, do 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 is cyclitol or cyclitol or cyclitol. Toll. C-Y-C-L-I-T-O-L. Noun from 1943. An allocyclic polyhydroxy compound. And an example of that would be inositol. Lots of words I don't understand. Next is... Now, it looks like civilization, but it's not. It is cycli- cyclization or cyclization because we're talking about the cycles. Noun from 1909. Formation of a ring in a chemical compound. And cyclize or just cyclize is a verb. So where did we have that before? Uh, where was the ring and the compound and the... Let's see... It's uh, here, I think this is it, from cyclic, or cyclic, of or relating to a chemical compound containing a ring of atoms. And so then the process of creation, the process of creating the ring, the creation of the ring, is cyclization. I hope you know what this little tune is. If you don't, hit me up. I will tell you. Next is cyclo or cyclo. Cyclo is not one of the options. Cyclo or cyclo. It is spelled C-Y-C-L-O. Noun from 1964. A three-wheeled, often motor-driven taxi. And I want to find a picture of one of these. It's French. Cyclo. And it means bicycle or moped. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's for the word from this word cycle, two or three wheeled vehicle. So this must be a thing that uh, they they probably drive around in in French in French in France or other European countries. A cyclo. Next is cyclo edition. One word, noun from 1963, a chemical reaction leading to ring formation in a compound. So we've had a few of these ring things in chemical compounds. Cycloaddition, cyclization, and then also just cyclic. Next is cycloaliphatic cycloaliphatic c y c l o a l i p h a t i c adjective from 1936 and the synonym is just allocyclic cycloaliphatic is also allocyclic and you can go way back to the a's to hear me talk about that which is probably something very scientific that i didn't understand Next is cyclocross, or just cyclocross. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1953. The sport of racing bicycles over rough terrain that usually requires carrying the bicycle over obstacles. (laughs) Well, Well, what's the point? Is it to see how quickly you can get off and on your bike? And if it's carryable, it seems kind of silly. Like, isn't the whole point to be on the bike? To to show your, your bicycling skills and not your carrying bicycle skills? But that's what it is. It is from Cyclo plus uh, Cross from Cross Country. So, yeah, it's like... You know, there's cross-country skiing and cross-country running, and the bicyclists wanted to get in on that, so they made a cyclocross. Next is cyclodextrin, noun from 1960. Any of a class of complex cyclic sugars that are products of the enzymatic decomposition of starch and 
that can catalyze reactions between simpler molecules which come together within the cylindrical body of the sugar. That is all I got for that. Next is our very last word. It sounds like a different song than what I originally intended it to be. Our last word is cyclodiene or cyclodiene. Emphasize the di or the ene. It is spelled C-Y-C-L-O-D-I-E-N-E. I shall say cyclodiene. Noun from 1942, an organic insecticide with a chlorinated methylene group forming a bridge across a six-membered carbon ring. And examples of this organic insecticide are dieldrin, dieldrin or chlordane. Yeah, these scientific uh, sections of the book are, are tough for me. You know, tomorrow, it looks like we're going to get a lot more of that. Uh, probably the next day after that. And uh, yeah, we're, we, we've got like a good four, three and a half, four episodes of a lot of these scientific-y words. All right, so the words in this episode were cycle, cycle, cycle way, cyclic, cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, cyclicity, cyclin, cyclist, cyclotol, cyclization, cyclo, or cyclo, actually, cycloaddition, cycloaliphatic, cyclocross, cyclodextrin, and cyclodyne. I will pick cycle as the word of the episode. Um, I have come to realize that just everything in life is a cycle. There's, there's all different sorts of cycles in the cosmos, in a human life, in the world, in the galaxy, in all the stuff. There is just filled and filled with cycles. Everything is a cycle. The day cycle, the life and death of just a cell, you know, from the super tiny, from atoms all the way up. I don't think atoms die, but, you know, other things live and die. The body lives and dies. Like I said, the day, the year, that's a big cycle that we deal with. Uh, you know, probably the the life and death of a of this of, of a planet, of the sun, of a star, of a probably a galaxy, maybe the whole universe, maybe that's a cycle. Even within your whole life there are cycles. There are there are, you know, it's probably different for everybody, but I feel like, at least for me personally, I feel like, oh, you know, every, you know, maybe 10 or 11 years or something, there's like a big change in my life. You know, I, uh, the, who knows why it probably is different for everybody, but yeah, cycles, man. I think about that stuff a lot. I do. I do. Cycles, cycles, life is made up of cycles. Cycles, cycles, life is made up of cycles. See what I did there? All right. That's going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome and welcome and welcome and welcome and welcome. Bienvenue. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary hosted by me, Spencer. I am reading this book and I'm telling you what I think about it as I go. I, things come to mind and I make jokes and comments and tell stories sometimes from my own life and then just give you my personal feelings and thoughts sometimes we get political and sometimes we don't um if you please 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 share this go tell some other people that there is a podcast called the dictionary where somebody is reading the dictionary and also talking about it and go ahead and write up a really 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 nice review five stars whichever podcast platform you're listening to this on go ahead and do that maybe you can do it on more than one of the platforms uh subscribe if you have not subscribed go to my youtube channel and subscribe there too just because hey you support what i do so go support all the stuff that i do um but you can actually find this podcast on the youtube channel just audio and it's a good time 
If you want to find me on social media, it is at DictionaryPod on Twitter and Instagram, where I post pictures and try to come up with slightly funny captions, although they're not usually funny. And uh, there's that's just a way to see visually what some of the things are that I talk about here. You can email me, DictionaryPod at gmail.com. In the show notes is a Google Voice number where you can call and leave a message if you wanted to. You can write up a little theme song ditty thing that I would put in an episode, possibly. And also, you can make your own sound effect that I will maybe possibly put into an episode. And, oh, you know, that's fine. This is the last section of 310, and... Uh, it's going to be a whole lot of more uh, science-y words that I may have a hard time pronouncing. I've already read through them, but I will have to be reminded when I get to each of them. And uh, my sound effects, the, just the one sound effect, I, don't, I only do the one. Uh, the one for yesterday is shockingly appropriate for today, but I'm going to do something else. Okay, the first word is cyclogenesis. C-Y-C-L-O-G-E-N-E-S-I-S. And every single one of these words will start with cyclo. And a lot of the ones in tomorrow's episode will also start with cyclo. All right. Cyclogenesis. Noun from circa 1938. The development or intensification of a cyclone. So when a cyclone is starting the beginning of it is cyclogenesis genesis we know is the word well you may not know because you're waiting for the g's possibly but as many people know genesis is the beginning of a thing and uh yeah so it's the the beginning or the intensification of a cyclone is cyclogenesis uh and the reason if we if we look back a couple episodes we had the uh, cyclo, or we had the, yeah, cycle or cyclo prefix, and, uh, I guess the example was not there, but we have either circle or cyclic, which basically means just going around in a circle, and that is what cyclones do. They're spinning and spinning and spinning. They don't get dizzy for some reason, but they spin a lot, and it's like a circle. That's why, yeah, okay. Uh, well, since so we will see cyclone later this episode, and my sound effect is going to be related to that. Cyclone, cyclogenesis, it's all the same world. We're going to just do a, like a, like a, whew, whew, whew. yeah. Next is cyclohexane. Cyclohexane. There's an X in there. Noun from circa 1909. A pungent saturated cyclic hydrocarbon C6H12 found in petroleum or made synthetically and used chiefly as a solvent and in organic synthesis. Synthesis. The whole word didn't get out. Uh, pungent, saturated, cyclic. Yeah, I don't really understand. Maybe it's, uh, yeah, you, maybe it's used in cars, possibly. It's found in petroleum. You can make it synthetically. I know there's synthetic oil. I just had to go get my oil changed with synthetic oil because that's what the dealer recommends. It was way more expensive than I was expecting. That's cyclohexane. Next is cyclohexanone. Cyclohexanone. H-E-X-A-N-O-N-E. Noun from circa 1909, again, a liquid ketone, C6H10O, used especially as a solvent and in organic synthesis. Yeah, I'm not going to have a whole lot to say for most of these words, just because I just don't understand, I mean, it's not that I don't understand science and chemistry stuff here, but I just can't give you more information is all. Next is cyclohexamide or cyclohexamide. Hexamide. Noun from 1950. An agricultural fungicide, C15H23NO4, that inhibits protein synthesis 
and is obtained from a soil bacterium. And the scientific name for this soil bacterium is Streptomyces griseus. That's all I got for that. Next. It is cyclohexylamine. Cyclo, H-E-X-Y-L-A-M-I-N-E. Cyclohexylamine. Noun from 1943. You know, I will say, though, that all of the parts of each of these words mean something. And we've obviously talked about this many, many times before. I'm not sure how how the cyclo part fits into these. Maybe when you... Maybe the molecule's in a circle shape. I'm not sure. But the hex probably means... I was thinking six, but I'm not so sure about that, actually. Uh, hex, I'm not sure what that means. The ane and cyclohexane means something. The the unknown or the known in cyclohexanone probably means something. And it all depends on what what are the what are the atoms? You know, they've got various numbers of carbon and different numbers of hydrogen and oxygen and all these. So based on that chemical structure, every part of the word means something. So I started to read cyclohexylamine. A lot, yeah, I don't know. Um, it is a colorless liquid amine, C6H11NH2. Now, why is the H separated? That's interesting. That there must be some reason for that. Uh, that is used in organic synthesis and to prevent corrosion in boilers, and that is believed to be harmful as a metabolic breakdown product of cyclamate. Uh, cyclamate, here's cyclamate. That is an artificially prepared salt of sodium or calcium used especially formerly as a sweetener. That was from two days ago. Two episodes ago, I guess. That was cyclo, no, cyclohexylamine. Next is cycloid. So it's cyclo with an I-D, cycloid. First form, noun from 1661, a curve that is generated by a point on the circumference of a circle as it rolls along a straight line. And cycloidal is an adjective. Uh, Yeah, this is from the Greek cycloides, which means circular. And I would have to take some time to think about what this means, except for the fact that they actually gave me a picture of what this is. So, I will try to describe this in a more visual way using words that you have to listen to and can't see. So, you, you let's say you got a... You gotta, oh, I know. A, a perfect example is a bike. A bike wheel. Make If you make a little mark, you know, don't puncture the bike, but if you make a little mark maybe with a Sharpie or something and put that mark on the ground. Then, if you wheel, if you roll the wheel along the ground in a straight line, the curve in the air that that point is, that the point that you drew on the tire, that point goes up in the air, and it arcs, 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 and then it starts to come back down, back to the ground, when the point meets the ground again. That arc, I think, is called the cycloid. It is a curve that is generated by a point on the circumference of a circle. So the circumference of a circle is the outside line of the circle. You put a point on there, you roll it along. As it rolls along a straight line, the arc, the, the, the curve that that point makes, I think you get it now. Okay, great. Why is this useful? I'm not sure. <laughs> Who uses this? Mathy geometry people. Um... Yeah, there's, there's, there's uses. I just don't know what they are. Uh, yeah. Next is the second form of cycloid. Adjective from 1847. One, smooth with concentric lines of growth. As in, cycloid scales. Okay, so uh, maybe on like a lizard or a fish or something, they got scales, 
And as they grow, or maybe as, you know, go from like the head to the tail, the size of the scales might change. Um, and they are, they, they have concentric lines of growth. Or maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, scales, I'm trying to think. Maybe the scales grow, they, 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 they add another line of growth to the scales as the, as the fish grows bigger. Hmm, something like that, maybe. Also, there's more to the definition. Also, having or consisting of cycloid scales. So something with cycloid scales could be called cycloid as an adjective. Number two, characterized by alternating high and low moods, as in a cycloid personality. So the characterized by alternating high and low moods. So if we look at the visual of the cycloid noun, the curve that is made by the point on the, the wheel, uh, it starts low, it goes up, goes back low, and then if you keep on wheeling over and over again, it's just going to keep on making that, that arc over and over again. Lows and highs, lows and highs. So that's why if somebody has lows and highs in their moods, they would have a cycloid personality. I think, I think really we all get that different times of day, different weeks, different months, different times of the year. Yeah, I think that's common. But there are going to be people who have higher highs and lower loads than maybe the average person. Next is cyclometer. Cyclometer. It's going to measure something. What is it going to measure? Noun from 1880. A device made for recording the revolutions of a wheel and often used for registering distance traversed by a wheeled vehicle. So, uh, if you're in a car and you know the size of the wheel and then it counts how many revolutions, how many times the wheel spins around, uh, one turn, when, when a point comes back to the same point it was, that's one revolution, uh, you can take how how many ever revolutions that was and multiply it by how long the circumference is, and then you know how far a thing has gone. So just for an example, if the, the circumference of the wheel is, well, let's make it easy. Let's say 10 feet. That's a pretty big wheel. Hmm. Let's maybe say one foot. Eh, yeah, one foot. And if it goes, if it spins 10 times, that means it's gone one foot 10 times, which means it's gone 10 feet. So the cyclometer is some piece of machinery that will just do that automatically. Next is cyclone. Noun from 1848. 1A. A storm or system of winds that rotates about a center, so it rotates around a center, of low atmospheric pressure advances at a speed of 20 to 30 miles an hour, which is about 30 to 50 kilometers an hour, and often brings heavy rain. So let's see. So it's got, a, I always get confused about low atmospheric pressure and high atmospheric pressure. I never learned like really what does that mean. Um, but we know that if there is a low pressure system, there could be, and depending on other conditions, there could be a cyclone. This, the, for whatever reason, the winds spin around a center point and this whole system moves together as it's spinning. Uh, kind of like the Earth. The Earth is spinning around its axis. You know, that's why we have day and night and day and night and day and night. But then it's also moving around the, the sun. It's actually moving a lot more than that, but that's all we'll get into right now. So this whole system is moving typically at about 20 to 30 miles an hour or 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. So that's like, you know, a low speed for a car, you know, most like residential neighborhoods might be like around 25 miles per hour. Um, so, you know, it's not slow, but it's not like crazy fast, but the winds the winds that are going around the center of this thing, those might be very, very fast. And it doesn't tell me what that might be here. Uh, yeah, I'll probably post a link about cyclones in the show notes. So that was 1A. 1B, the synonym is tornado. It's 
Just another name for the same thing, I believe. I don't think that there's really any difference. Number 1C is the 1B definition for the fourth form of the word low, and I have to imagine that's talking about the low atmospheric pressure system example. Number two, any of various centrifugal devices for separating materials as solid particles from gases. So I believe that would be a thing that spins around a lot to separate these particles and gases. And the reason that would be a cyclone, cyclone, why we have this prefix is because it's going around, it's spinning, spinning, spinning in a circle. Cyclonic is an adjective and cyclonically is an adverb. This is a modified word from the Greek cycloma or kykloma, and that means wheel or coil. I feel like I need to learn Greek just to do this podcast. Uh, it is also from the Greek kykloon or cycloon, which means to go around. That one is spelled K-Y-K-L-O-U-N, to go around. And then also from cyclos or kyklos, which means circle, going around in a circle. That's what a cyclone is. And it maybe kind of sort of makes that sound. Next is cyclone again with a capital C. This is a trademark, and it is used for a chain link fence. So there is a company brand name of Cyclone for these fences. Why they picked the name Cyclone, I'm not so sure. I do feel like I've seen these. I think I've seen Cyclone on chain link fences. Maybe maybe they're so strong, but they also have really big holes in them that if a Cyclone comes, it won't tear up the chain link fence. It'll just go right through it. I have no idea, but maybe. Next is Cyclone Cellar. Two words. Cellar is C-E-L-L-A-R. It's another name for basement. And it is a noun from 1887. And the synonym is just Storm Cellar. Dorothy did not get into the Cyclone Cellar, which is why she went or which is the reason why she went on a whole wonderful, colorful adventure. Next is, here we go. The rest of these are mostly uh, more scientific names or words. We have cyclo <laughs> Okay, there's a double O. Cyclo, and then the next part of it starts with an O. So it's a little bit weird. We're going to have a few of these. cyclo Olefen, cyclo olefen, spelled cyclo O L E F I N, cyclo olefen, noun from circa 1929, a hydrocarbon containing a ring having one or more double bonds. And cyclo olefenic, yeah, cyclo olefenic is an adjective. One or more double bonds, so there's, there's multiple connections between the atoms, and it's a ring, and I don't know what olefin means. Next is cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenase. The word oxygen is in there. Noun from 1975, an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of arachidonic acid, an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of arachidonic acid to prostaglandins and that has two isoforms of which one is involved in the creation of prostaglandins which mediate inflammation and pain. Wow. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's an enzyme and it makes this stuff happen and there's other, there's multiple forms of it or something. I don't know. I think, I think, yeah, that's fine. (laughs) Stay away from a cyclone, please. If you see one, just, just run away or drive away even better. 
Next is cycloparaffin. Cycloparaffin, double F, noun from 1900, a saturated cyclic hydrocarbon of the formula C, oh, okay, CN and then H2N. So what the N means, it, it stands for number, basically. So any number of carbons will, in oh, how do I describe this? So N, you pick a number, say two. You got two, two Cs, but then because there's, a two, there's an N next to the H, H2N, then you take that number and you multiply it by two, and then you have that many hydrogens. So if we have two carbons, then we got four hydrogens. If we got eight carbons, then we got 16 hydrogens. So, uh, yeah, saturated cyclic hydrocarbon that has that formula. So any combination of that carbons and hydrogens, double the hydrogens to carbons, can be this cycloparaffin, I guess. How, how high can those numbers go? I got no idea. Do you know chemistry? Let me know. I will... I will, I will mention it somewhere. Next is cyclopean or cyclopean. C-Y-C-L-O-P-E-A-N. Cyclopean or cyclopean. Adjective from 1582. Number one is often capitalized of relating to or characteristic of a cyclops. Yeah, it's kind of right there in the name, cyclopean. Number two, the synonyms are huge and massive. And I think that's still closely related to cyclops because, you know, according to mythology, they were large creatures, people? What were they? Something. Number three, of or relating to a style of stone construction marked typically by the use of large, irregular blocks without mortar. Mortar is the stuff that you put between the blocks or the stones or the bricks. And so they say, no, we don't need no mortar. We're just going to put in these weird block shapes. Hmm. So maybe we need to find a picture of this type of stone construction, cyclopean. Or would this one be cyclopean? And also, what's the etymology for that? That doesn't tell me. Why is it called that for this stone construction? Hmm. Next. It is. Well, it should be easy to pronounce. It is cyclopedia. <laughs> yeah, cyclopedia spelled with an E or an A-E. And a noun from 1728. The synonym is literally just encyclopedia we added an en to this word cyclopedia became encyclopedia and that is the word i think that we're that we're more familiar with what 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 happened why did it start as cyclopedia it there is no etymology i might need to look more into this if i'm using cyclo the cyclo prefix to mean circle or cyclic, I can't think of how that connects to an encyclopedia. Mm, not sure. Not sure. This is very odd. But that's what it is. And then for some reason, they decided to put an en at the beginning. So maybe when we get, maybe there's an en prefix and we'll learn about why. Why? Cyclopedic is an adjective. There is one more word for this episode. It is cyclophosphamide. Cyclo, maybe it's more cyclophosphamide. I think that makes more sense. C-Y-C-L-O-P-H-O-S-P-H-A-M-I-D-E. Cyclophosphamide. Noun from 1960. An immunosuppressive and antineoplastic agent, C7, H15, Cl2, N2, O2, P. Used especially in the treatment 
of lymphomas and some leukemias. I think those are types of cancers, either maybe blood or bone cancers. Uh, but this is an immunosuppressive and anti anti neoplastic agent, so it helps. This uh, cyclophosphamide helps people, hopefully, with lymphomas and leukemias. So now I shall read quickly the words to you. We had cyclogenesis, cyclohexane, cyclohexanone, cyclohexamide, cyclohexylamine, cycloid, cycloid, cyclometer, cyclone, cyclone, cyclone cellar, cyclooleffen, cyclooxygenase, cycloparaffin, cyclo- cyclopean, cyclopedia, and cyclophosphamide. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, I am going to pick cyclone cellar as the word of the episode. I think every house should have a cellar, a basement, and if they've got those old school doors that you see in horror movies all the time, even better. Yeah, if they're all rusty or fallen apart, maybe there's a broken lock on there. I don't know. I'm just, you know, you, you just see that in movies all the time. But yeah, you, a lot of places don't get cyclones, but, you know, better safe than sorry, right? You never know. With climate change, the whole world might start getting cyclones and tornadoes. So you got to be prepared. What are you going to put in your cyclone cellar? What are you going to put in your cyclone cellar? Lots of canned goods, lots of water, and maybe some phone chargers. (laughs) Well, that went down the tubes. All right. I think that's a fine place to end this episode. I very much appreciate you listening to this if you are. And if you're not, go listen. That makes sense. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye.